Good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy our June 22nd Planning Commission meeting. And so we'll start off with a flag salute. Maybe you could join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, could we have a roll call? Nathan Herzog? Yes, here. Richard Johnson? Here. Anthony DiMatte? Here. Robin Dahlgren? Here. Daniel Woodward? Here. Mark Watts? Here. Bridget Powers? Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's Planning Commission meeting. And it's open to virtual and in-person participation and may be observed online through the Placer County website. If you would like to make public comment, please fill out the speaker slip, which is located on a table near the door and provided to the planning staff. For the members of the public attending via Zoom, please raise your hand with the hand icon on the bottom of the page. And if you are calling in, press star nine to raise your hand. Please be prepared to speak at the time I open the public comment for a specific item you would like to address which may include of the comment for matters not included on the agenda, the consent item, or timed item. Each commenter will be entitled to three minutes to comment time. Thank you for your patience as we work to ensure that each person who wishes to comment has an opportunity, opportunity to do so. Please be advised that today's meeting is being recorded. Okay, at this time, I'll ask the planning director to give us a report. Hey, good, good morning, Chair Johnson, uh, Commissioners, Chris Bahuli, Planning Director. Uh, I do have a uh, handful of updates for you this morning. Uh, wanted to start with uh, the Project 8 winery. Um, on Tuesday, the board voted to approve the uh, entitlement package for the Project 8 winery. I did want to note that the board did further modify the commission's recommendations on the ZTA language uh, to include additional limitations on the types of large wineries that could take advantage of the height exception. Uh, specifically, they increased the minimum property size from 20 to 40 acres, uh, and they also required that a minimum of two acres up from, I'm sorry, uh, 10 acres up from two acres uh, be planted with vineyards. Uh, additionally, prior to the hearing, staff received a letter from the State Department of Conservation expressing concern related to the project's compatibility with the Williamson Act. Uh, specifically, the concern was tar uh, targeted to the number of residences on the Williamson Act contracted land and the increase in people requested for agricultural promotional events. Uh, conditions were modified by staff prior to the hearing and an errata was provided to the board that limited the residential use uh, on the property to the owner or manager only and reduced the number of people for agricultural promotional events from 75 to 50 consistent with the, Williams, or consistent with the winery ordinance. I should note that the winery ordinance does allow for consideration of additional persons, as, as this commission is aware, uh, through the use permit process. Uh, so that, that reduction was, was made as part of the conditions of approval. There is a provision in that condition, however, that should the Department of Conservation um, uh, uh, provide approval to the, uh, or provide confirmation to the county that the, um, the approach of having more people for agricultural promotional events is not a concern, uh, the planning director can increase that number back up to 75. And so there will be ongoing communication between 
uh, staff and the State Department of Conservation as it relates to that matter. Uh, I should note that also the board did add a condition related to providing signage for the tw up to 12 special events that can be held uh, at the Project 8 winery. Um, that condition will require that, they, that a sign be posted outside of the property uh, on Callison Road or near Callison Road uh, so that uh, passersby and also neighbors are aware of who they can call if they have any concerns with the event. Uh, following the deliberations, the board did uh, approve the entitlement package. They approved the, uh, the environmental impact report on a five to zero vote. They approved the zoning text amendment on a four yes, one no vote. And they approved the conditional use permit on a four yes, zero no, one abstention vote. Uh, the next update that I'd like to provide uh, to the Commission is re related to the general plan update. Uh, on June 13th, staff presented the scope of work um, and draft RFP to the uh, board. The board provided direction to staff to release the RFP and provided some input on the process. Uh, staff is working to release the RFP. We're expecting that it will go out before the week's end. Uh, we are also in process of meeting with the uh, individual MACs and providing updates to them about the general plan update process and how they can be involved. Uh, we do intend to uh, bring back before the board an agreement for the contract for the general plan update sometime in late August, maybe early uh, September, somewhere around that time frame. Uh, the next update I wanted to provide is related to the, um, the county's rezone uh, efforts to meet the RENA, and the regional housing needs allocation. And so as the commission is aware, when the housing element was approved in 2021, there was a program, HE1, housing element program one, that uh, uh, required a minimum of up to 55 acres be rezoned um, for multifamily, actually at that time we were looking at an overlay zone that would encourage multifamily development on those properties that were subject to the rezone. Uh, we are going through that process now. We have uh, sent out letters to approximately 70 owners, letting them know of the uh, intent to rezone their properties. We are hopeful that the, the, we will get a number of voluntary uh, participants as part of that program, uh, and we will uh, be meeting with them. We've, with those letters, we've encouraged them to reach out to us. We can meet with them and provide information about the rezone effort. Um, we will likely be back in front of the board, uh, again, around that August-September timeframe with an update on the list of properties and on our en engagement with those property owners uh, and their interest in participating in the rezone program. Um, a couple of more just real logistical updates. Um, as it relates to the email accounts, there will be a training after uh, the Planning Commission meeting in the Cypress Room just behind me. Um, so hopefully you've brought your laptops and we're hopeful that this uh, Take Two training will be, will be successful. We weren't alerted to that. Oh, you weren't? Okay. Mm -hmm. No email, no nothing. Yeah, I didn't know about it either. I got one. I received yeah, it. I got I one. Did. I got one. Maybe I got it on the new email and I didn't open it. <laughs> you probably did. I probably didn't know me, but I didn't. Oh, I, I didn't even bring my laptop. Yeah. So. I didn't know, but I can always come back and do it another yeah, time. Too. That's easy for me. We can do that. So for those of you that, that, that did bring it, we can do that today. And uh, for those that didn't, we can do it next time. Okay. And then last update is on the, uh, on the calendar. So I know that at uh, a previous meeting, I believe it was Commissioner Dahlgren that suggested that we do a, a calendar of upcoming vacations. I know that Andrea had sent out an email to all of you. Uh, requesting that you update the uh, calendar that she provided. Uh, we are tracking the, the vacations that are upcoming. I've identified one potential issue with the September 14th um, Planning Commission hearing. I believe both Commissioners Dahlgren and Woodward are, are planning to be absent on that date. Um, and so we will be monitoring uh, if any additional commissioners may be absent. We might have to look at maybe moving 
or canceling that, that uh, meeting. That concludes uh, the planning director's report. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. I, I have one question, but go ahead. No, go ahead, Anthony. Um, That's fine. From the change of the zoning for personal property, I've had some complaints from people who live in Newcastle. Is this part of that same change of zoning that so they they were t they told me their properties have already been changed without them being notified? It is the same. Um, uh, it is the same effort. Uh, we have had conversations with property owners in Newcastle um, that have indicated their concern with being on the list as. Uh, the planning commissioner, planning commission is likely aware when the housing element was adopted in 2021, there was a list of properties that were included with the housing element. Uh, a number of those property owners have expressed concern about being on the list and would like to be removed. Um, we will be, as I mentioned, going to the board at a, at a later date um, with a with a um, conversation about uh, culling the list for property owners that don't want to participate. The way I just to it is add that, to that too. What's that? Go ahead. Those those properties that are identified on the list as potential rezones, that rezone has not yet occurred. Those properties are not rezoned. In order for the properties to be rezoned, it would need to come to the planning commission and the board okay. for approval. So, so the people that are complaining in Newcastle, they may be just on the list, but they're not. Nothing has been rezoned. That's correct. They're candidate sites um, okay. as part of the rezone effort. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is not how I recall it. Um, I appreciate Anthony's question, though. It's the same type of question. Um, when the housing element went through, we had a, an extensive discussion about this, a lot of protest about it and it was processed through the Board of Supervisors. Is that not an accurate statement? I mean, these, as I recall, we had extensive discussion about this, and these properties were in fact being rezoned. And they should have already been rezoned. So is, is that part of the housing element or not? As part of the housing element, there is a program, HE1, that requires that within three years of the adoption of the housing element, that those uh, that um, sites be rezoned. It identified a minimum of 55 acres that needed to be rezoned as part of the housing element program one. As Clayton mentioned, the sites that are identified as the candidate sites have not been rezoned. That needs to occur before May 2024. Okay, so when we act on this in the future, is a housing element update going to need to be it going to be required with HCD or not? Yes, it, there will need to be an amendment to the housing element as part of that. Pro as part of that. Okay, so the county's position is that going back to HCD and amending the housing element is a perfectly acceptable task in this particular case. Correct. Okay, great. <laughs> Since I wasn't here at that time that you discussed this, just a quick question. Of the 55 acres that you've identified as potential, are those spread across the, the districts? They, they are. They're, they're spread across all five districts. Um, and I should say that, that the Housing Element Program 1 identified 55 acres. That 55 acres accounted to about 1,100 units, uh, which is what the shortfall in our, in our inventory was uh, identified as. And so, uh, yes, to answer your question, it is spread across um, um, the five districts. There is a heavy concentration, I should know, in District 5. This leads me to another question. If landowners refuse this, um, what are the ramifications? And would it set off eminent domaining properties to comply with state HD1 or is there a fine that would have to be paid because of HD1 by the county or by these residents that are on this list? What are the ramifications for the owners of these properties that could be taken? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned earlier, um, we obviously want to find as many voluntary participants in the program as possible. That's why the candidate rezone list is larger than the amount of acreage that's needed okay. um, to satisfy the requirement. Um, if we do get to a point of involuntary rezones, um, 
uh, we'll have to work through that process. The county does have the authority, does have land use authority, and does have the ability to rezone properties, uh, and it would not be um, subject to an imminent domain action. It would not be. Subject. It would not be. I don't know if county council has anything to add to that, but no. Yeah, no, I, I, I would concur with what Chris has indicated. So it can be rezoned without the property owner's consent, but it's still to the property owner's ability and willingness to either sell that property or just leave it the way it is, right? He doesn't have to comply, right? If I'm a landowner, you guys change my zoning, I don't have to go build houses on it. I could leave it stagnant. That is correct. Sure. The, under, okay. the underlying zoning can be changed, and yeah, it, it's not a requirement that it must be the property must be built. It's just if it is built, it would need to be built in accordance with the zoning requirement. So if nothing is available, if nothing gets built, what are the ramifications on the county from the state? Nothing. We wouldn't be in compliance because we'd, would we not be in yeah, compliance? Yeah, the exercise we the exercise for the county is to have enough land zoned for multifamily development. It's not to have it be built, but we do um, endeavor to meet our regional housing needs allocation goals. So okay. producing units is important. Um, it, the answer to your question is a little bit more nuanced than um, in that. Um, as we continue to do housing elements on a, on an eight-year cycle, if there are sites that aren't developed, we may not be able to keep them on the inventory in future cycles. But again, that's a conversation down the road. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, now is the time when I'm... <clears throat> I want to open uh, the meeting up to people who want to make a public comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Is, uh, is there anybody in the room that has a public comment that's not on the agenda? Okay, step forward, sir. The airport rezone is on our agenda, but it's planned to be uh, continued today. And so the so the Planning Commission will probably be continuing it today. So I could talk about that? So, uh, well, it's on the agenda at a specific time. If you want to talk, you're sure welcome to do that. But it's on the agenda. Uh, okay. And I could speak about that. It is listed as an item at 1030. The, yeah, I the thought air, it was 10. I made a mistake. Should I wait? So um, the request that's being made from staff is to continue that item to a later date. The Planning Commission would need to vote on that request to continue it. Um, but I, in the history of having sit at this, sitting it uh, here at the, the council table, I haven't seen an instance where um, a request from, for a continuance from staff has been denied by the Planning Commission, but it is still up to the commission if they would want to continue it or not. I, I really don't know what any of what you just said means. Uh, okay. I was if, here. I got a letter saying come if it gets yeah. continued a month ago I came nothing was here so yeah. it, if it, it'll be heard at 1030 it will likely be continued to a date later okay so I should wait till 1030 to spill my beans <laughs> if you'd like to do so yeah. yep and we'll give you an opportunity to, Thank you. to speak at that time okay are there any other items huh? I want to talk about the airport also Okay. Because I only had notice of three days from the planning commission to know this was going on, which I don't think is uh, proper. You know, you know, you know ma'am, if you want to talk, you need to talk into the microphone. But basically, oh, okay. we're going to have, no uh, have that item on the, on our agenda here okay. shortly. I'm here for the airport um, overflight. It's on the agenda, so so I can ca talk at 10:30. Yeah, or when it when it comes up. Glad to. Thank you. Is that it for the audience in the room? Is there anybody on the? Uh, huh? Okay. We have somebody that's uh, on the Zoom. So uh, whoever's there can go ahead. Caller nine one six seven one nine seven two nine six. You have three minutes.
Well, good morning. This is Michael Garabedi, and am, uh, am I getting through now? Yes, you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, when, and Michael, uh, you the, have something the, uh, that you want to talk about that's item not came on the agenda? Up. Uh, pardon me? Michael, is the item that you want to talk about not on the agenda? Not on the agenda. Well, the, the uh, planning director discussed what the Board of Supervisors did on the winery ordinance issue, and that's what I want to talk about. I don't believe it's on the agenda. Okay, Is that so, correct? so you have three minutes. Thank you. So uh, in my introduction yesterday, opposing that item, I, I spoke about two shortcut ways of thinking about property rights. One is that one person's property rights ends where the, their neighbors begin. And you can think of property rights as a bundle of sticks that the government gives to property owners and takes away. Uh, the first thing that happened there that I think was offensive to property owners was people were, speakers were limited to two minutes. So the people who had concerns and had something to say substantively about the project other than I approve it uh, were severely limited and I think unfairly limited. And I think it's a sign of what's happening with property rights, that project in particular around the county where the county is uh, gathering property rights from people, the existing people that live there, and transferring them, in effect, to uh, projects like this. It's just rampant throughout the county. So I think, I think we have a serious property rights issue here in this county. Uh, I think that something needs to be done about it to try to figure out how to protect existing community from having towers spring up all over, whether it's that or people who want to develop or do something, uh, giving everything from variances uh, uh, to uh, minor divisions. Uh, it's reflected in a number of ways. For instance, the Crosser County has the highest concentration of wildland and urban interface. I began complaining about this to the uh, land division uh, gentleman uh, 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 years ago, pointing out this, this, uh, these are unsafe areas to be uh, you know, providing more houses. And now we have the ADUs going in out there. Uh, in remote places where kids home from school or elderly people will be living now, even more wildland urban interface issues. So um, something something really needs to be done to wake up the county about protecting the rights of existing owners, whether uh, for almost any kind of uh, development. It just, it just seems across the board and um, uh, that property rights are fair game. Existing people who have property rights in their neighborhoods and their communities are under a, a kind of uh, neglect, really, more than neglect. So um, I hope that that kind of concern will enter enter your deliberations as, as part of your responsibility to protect the what is the police power under a 1926 court decision of the United States Supreme Court to protect the, the, the health, safety, general welfare, of the, the existing community and to not let that be overrun uh, by, for instance, a whole phalanx of people coming in to support the project. Okay. Anyway, thank you for this opportunity to weigh in and have a good meeting. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Welcome. Is there, is there anybody else? Okay. Well, at this time, we'll, we'll move on and uh, take on the consent agenda. Which this time is really just is uh, basically the uh, results of our May 25th meeting, and so is there anybody uh, <coughs> on, that wants to uh, pull that agenda? Anybody in the audience? Anybody online? Okay, nobody. So um, so we'll go ahead and uh, do a roll call. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. I have a motion by Commissioner Powers, a second by Commissioner DiMatte. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Powers? Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And so we'll move on now to uh, our first item. And we have Michelle Kingsbury here, and she's going to give us some information about the uh, 
some changes in the small lot tentative map in relationship to the Placer Ranch Pacific plan. Hi, good morning, Commissioners. Michelle Kingsbury with the Community Development Resource Agency. I do look forward to the day where I can come forward with a cool, sexy project for you. <laughs> um, but when you see me come before you, it's usually with administrative technical cleanup items related to um, a lot of our fiscal components of our development projects. And this item before you today is one of those. Um, the item before you today is to seek uh, your approval and recommendation to change uh, several, several conditions of approval related to the Phase 1A small lot tentative map uh, for the Placer Ranch specific plan, as well as seeking a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to amend the correlated mitigation measures that are associated with the same uh, components. Um, these changes are for things um, such as uh, requirements for annexation and or formation of county service area zones of benefit or community facilities districts which um, we require new growth development to um, either annex into or form that will provide revenues to support the additional services associated with these types of developments. Uh, there are no changes to the project um, in and of itself um, and therefore no changes to any of the physical impacts or anything else associated with these projects. Uh, these are uh, technical administrative cleanup items. Uh, the reason we are here before you today uh, seeking your concurrence on the condition of approval amendments as well as the recommendations on the mitigation measure changes is because uh, it's meant to align what we approved in the 2019 development agreement for the Plaza Ranch specific plan and align those requirements for the same items to the conditions of approval and the mitigation measures so um, they're all consistent with each other. Unfortunately, right now they are not uh, and therefore we are seeking um, this action before you today. Um, I can certainly go into each one if you'd like me to. Um, otherwise, they are just administrative technical cleanup meant to align to the development agreement requirements, which are already in effect. Um, to uh, summarize and keep it short and simple, um, we are looking to have all the requirements and triggers uh, consistent uh, to be triggered at um, the first small lot, for, small lot uh, final map and or building permit associated with any non-residential um, uses and that's our consistent trigger of when we want these types of financial mechanisms in place um, to then start uh, generating revenues when the houses uh, typically come online. Um, so again, happy to, to go into more technical detail if you'd like me to. We did receive one public comment um, and I apologize because it uh, basically in summary is it was a little confusing what the action is. Um, but it is a technical cleanup amendment um, to align all the requirements to be consistent with each other. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Just one quick question. Sure, this course. was an action that's initiated by the county, right? It was an action initiated uh, with staff uh, to clean it all up in right. concert with the development applicant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Sure, of course. Okay, well, thank you. Someday I'll have a cool project. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so at this time, I'll, I'll ask if there's anybody in the public that would like to comment on this or has a question on the on the Zoom or on the screen. No. Okay. Well, no questions. So uh, you're off the hook, Michelle. I think. So thank you. Uh, we need an action before you today. Yeah. There's uh, four items. Yeah. Do you have a slide? Well, that's an action item, I agree. Yeah. I can read them. I unfortunately did not prepare a slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. If you'd I, like me to, I can go ahead and read I, I the actions either. in the board memo. You want to say something? Okay. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. Yeah. I want to read the action. And is this a recommendation for the board of supervisors or is this approval? It's a recommendation, I believe, for the supervisors. So there's actually both a recommendation and approval. Uh, if you look at your staff report packet at page 10, the recommendation is what I'd suggest yeah. going off of. And I've got a copy if you'd like it. So uh, the conditions of approval, uh, the conditions of approval, the modifications to the map is something the Planning Commission is taking action on. The mitigation measure modification is something that is being recommended to the Board of Supervisors to take action on. Okay. What about 2A? So yes, uh, 2A and 
what's identified as three, but probably should be two B. Um, items, the, the items two A and two B are the recommendations to the Board of Supervisors, and items one A and one B are the actions that the Planning Commission would be taking. <coughs> Okay, I have 1A, 1B, 2A, and 3. Right, I, 3 should be 2B. Okay. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the modification to Foster Ranch Phase 1A small lot tentative subdivision map PLN 2100533, conditions of approval number 110, Number 154, number 155, number 156, number 157, and number 159, as shown in this staff report and as explained in attachment A. Second. Here we have a motion and a second. Roll call. I have a motion by Commissioner Herzog, a second by Commissioner DiMatte. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to further move that we approve as a planning commission to determine that the modifications to the conditions of approval do not result in changes to the physical environment or result in any new or more significant environmental effect than were previously analyzed in the PRSP APEIR pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15162 through 15164 and 15183. Second. Any motion and a second? Roll yes, call. we have a, a motion by Commissioner Herzog and a second by Commissioner DiMatte. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to further move that we recommend to the Board of Supervisor to, to, uh, Supervisors to adopt a resolution amending Sunset Area Plan, Foster Ranch Specific Plan Mitigation <coughs> Monitoring and Reporting <coughs> Program to modify triggers and mitigation measures 4.13-1A, 4.13-2, 4.13-4, 4.13-8, and 4.14-13B for the creation of or annexation into a county service area zone of benefit and community facilities district as shown in attachment B. Second. That was fun. Nice job. Roll call. Um, I have a, we have a, a, a motion by Commissioner Herzog, a second by Commissioner DiMatte. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? No. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> I was thinking something else. Okay. I apologize. Wow. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Aye. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to recommend to the Board of Supervisors that uh, we determine that modifications to the mitigation monitoring and reporting program do not result in changes to the physical environment or result in any new or more significant environmental effects than were previously analyzed in the PRSP SAPEIR pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15162 through 15164 and 15183. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Herzog, a second by Commissioner DiMatte. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Aye. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I guess we're done with that. Uh, we do have the opportunity for appeal, I guess, on items 1A and 1B. And so uh, if somebody wants to appeal those items, and they have to do with the small lot uh, tentative map and uh, conditions of approval if, uh, of the first project. And so if, if uh, somebody would like to appeal it, they need to submit a, a check for 688 bucks, as well as do that within 10 days. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the next item.
And let me see, the next item is dealing with the White Hawk uh, subdivision at Granite Bay. And let me see, for this we have Jared Peters is going to make the presentation. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and the Commissioners. Jared Peters with the Planning Services Division. I'm here to, pre to present the White Hawk One Extension of Time Project. The project, uh, the White Hawk, excuse me. The White Hawk One subdivision is proposed the south side of Douglas Boulevard, east of Wood of Woodgrove Way in Granite Bay. The project site consists of 18.1 acres with 20 with 24 single family, single story homes with lot sizes ranging from 9,025 to 16,651 square feet. 54% of the project area will be open space, including a 300, 300 foot scenic buffer along Douglas Boulevard. The project was approved by the board supervisors on June 9th, 2020, with an expiration date of June 9th of this year. The county received an application for an extension of time on May 15th, 2023. If approved, the tentative map would have a new expiration date of June 9th, 2025. The project approvals include a general plan amendment and community plan amendments to adjust the zoning and designation from rural residential and rural low density residential to low density residential and open space, a rezone from residential agriculture combining a minimum building site of 100,000 square feet and a planned residential development of 0 0.5 residential units per acre to residential agriculture combining a minimum building site of 20,000 square feet and a planned residential development of 1.4 residential units per acre and for the 300 foot setback area to be rezoned to open space. A, a, as well as those, it includes a vesting tentative subdivision map for the subdivision of 18.09 acres into a 24 lot planned residential development with seven open with with seven open space and common area lots, a conditional use permit to construct a planned residential development and a variance to lot coverages allowing up to 50% coverage for a single story residences where 25 to 40% is normally allowed. The project site was rezoned to include 3.96 acres of open space and 25.17 acres of residential agriculture, combining minimum building site of 20,000 square feet, combining planned residential development of 1.4 dwelling units per acre. As part of the project's improvements, the project was conditioned to widen Douglas Boulevard from Sierra College Boulevard to east of Cabot Stallman Road. The offsite work was a significant project cost and necessitated, and necessitated a cost adjustment in the Granite Bay Capital Improvement Program earlier this year. The project would construct the widening and be reimbursed for the work up to the amount allocated in the Capital Improvement Program minus the project's fair share cost contribution. Staff's recommendation today to the Planning Commission is to approve the two-year extension of time request for the White Hawk One conditional use permit variance and vesting tentative, sub, sub, vesting tentative subdivision map based on the previously certified environmental impact report, errata, and addendum, and subject to the modified conditions of approval based on the findings contained in the staff report. We did receive uh, one piece of public comment concerned with the potential future traffic due to the uh, increased density as part of the project. I'm available for any questions you may have. Okay. Yeah, I actually have a question, Jared. First of all, uh, I think you're relatively new here. I don't recall seeing you do this very often. So uh, good job. Thank you. And uh, good briefing and a good staff package as well. Thank you. Uh, this is not a question you may have an answer immediately to, but I bet someone in the room might. So I'm going to refer it to you, but uh, perhaps you may deflect it a little bit. And this is about educating me, to be honest with you, because I, I am not... Uh, real familiar with the capital improvement program. I don't want a 20 minute lecture on what it is, but uh, it would be, it's interesting to me that this uh, exists as a very high cost project for sure. So can you elaborate a little bit more on 
on, on the process for using funds out of the capital improvement program to support this particular project. There we go. I knew somebody would do this. Uh, this is Candace Bartlett with Engineering and Surveying. I'm, uh, I also help represent Department of Public Works. Um, so we take forward CIP increases at the request of the public, and in the ca this case, Whitehawk 1 um, requested for these improvements to be considered, and it was approved by the Board of Supervisors to increase the cost associated with it. Um, and then it just is a coincidence that this project obviously is affected by that change in cost. Okay, so how does this, how does this uh, program get, this pocket get filled? In other words, where does this money come from? This is just a taxpayer allocation, and does it actually, uh, does the board approve the funds that go into this program, or how does that work exactly? They're applied at building permit issuance um, for single-family dwellings and also for commercial projects. So it's like a fee? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So to reiterate, sorry about that. To reiterate, so the money comes from the general fund that the county has now, and then it's paid back by the developer. Or is there bonds put on, or fees, Melrose or whatever, put on the properties to be paid back to widen this project? I guess I misunderstood something. So the capital improvement program is a list of all of the road uh, projects within the county that may um, that the county has an interest in pursuing. And then uh, each project that comes in is required to contribute as part of the project approval to that condition, that capital improvement program. And that contribution comes in at building permits. So when there's an application for a building permit, they have to pay a certain amount that goes to the capital improvement program. So it does, it's not really general fund dollars. It's allocated to that capital improvement program. Um, but there are certain projects located in that capital improvement program. and the inclusion of projects or amendments to costs of projects included in the program do go to the board and the board determines what what projects should be included in and also if certain if a project's going to cost more or less that update also goes to the board as well so for this particular project i guess there's public comment concerns about traffic so does this set off motions to improve this sierra college and douglas boulevard before this project can be built or and then it's reimbursed after that or matched after that or what is I guess my other question is what is the traffic concern is it does this going to increase traffic because of the density and if that's going to increase traffic does this set the motion to go widen these roads so Department of Public Works determines what projects within that capital improvement program uh, go first or second or third and, and so they're the ultimate de determiners of the timing of those um, certain projects that come in do have improvements that are required with those projects. Um, and that may characterize when those need to be uh, completed. And in those instances, then the developer may have to complete that project and then get reimbursement from the capital improvement program at some point down the road. OK. Did I answer that? Feel free to correct me if I No, that's that. correct. I just wanted to note that the conditions of approval for this project did require that improvement on Douglas Boulevard um, between Whitehawk 1 and 2. Um, the environmental review analyzed transportation and traffic impacts um, and the mitigation measures and conditions of approval are applied accordingly. So the change in the fee, the CIP program is kind of separate from the traffic and transportation concerns. Those would have been addressed with the environmental review and the requirements of improvements. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I know we didn't get it. I know this is just an extension of time, but it's just for my own knowledge and everybody else's. Thank you. Okay. Is that it for the questions? <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. We might call you back later, so so stick around. But Okay, the applicant. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Marcus LaDuca, 3300 Douglas Boulevard, Roseville, on behalf of the applicant. I um, wanted to thank you for the opportunity to come before you to request this extension of time uh, for the project uh, entitlements, um, other, you know, for the use permit, the map, uh, and the variance. Um, to allow this project to continue the work uh, on the subdivision. Um, just to, for the record, the project has, uh, is an uh, engineer is preparing improvement plans for the subdivision. We hope to submit those in 30 days for the offsite road work. Uh, we are looking to go out to bid on those improvements. 
uh, within the next uh, two to three weeks. Um, again, we've seen a little bit of a, a, a respite um, in cost increases out there um, in the marketplace, and we thought it would be a good time to take advantage of those um, and start the work in short order. Um, uh, Commissioner Woodward, Commissioner Dubete had uh, very good questions relative to the the cap the road. This is the roadway capital improvement program, so not others. Um, you know, you, when you adopt a community plan, you have certain improvements you want to see done. Um, you will then uh, look at the, all the DUEs that are left to be built, um, both residential and non-residential in the community plan, plan area. A nexus study is done, and then you spread those uh, costs uh, in the in terms of the traffic. Uh, impact fee. Uh, none of this money is general fund. None of this money is bond funded. Um, so if you look at one of your conditions, condition, it's uh, being revised, condition 110, uh, the traffic fees in uh, the Granite Bay Community Plan since this project was adopted in 2020, um, there's been annual adjustments they do for uh, cost of living increases um, every July. Uh, those fees are now up to $9,236 per single family dwelling. Um, a 24 lot subdivision uh, maybe a you know a, a fraction of one percent of the need for that improvement. When, as uh, staff mentioned, when the two projects went together in the IR, there was a trigger um, for the improvement uh, of the widening from Sierra College Boulevard to Cabot Stallman South. But um, so one of them had to construct it. But again, you have to look at nexus requirements and the burden of the project uh, on that improvement. Um, so you subtract out that small fraction of 1% of the impact of 24 lots um, that use that roadway. The requirement from both the commission and the board uh, was for the latter of the two projects to construct the improvement. The improvement, however, um, is subject to reimbursement or over the fair share to meet legal requirements. Um, so that's why you have a capital improvement program and from time to time that gets adjusted. Uh, by the board um, to reflect what costs, you know, costs are happening in the marketplace, costs of improvements, because you don't want to have a fee program that's underfunded, that basically is charging a fee level here when the improvement costs are up here and you, you have a gap. And so they adjust the um, capital improvement uh, program amounts and then adjust the development impact fees to reflect those so they match. So when you actually go to build the improvement, you're fully funded by traffic fees. There is no shortfall. So that's why you see these adjustments uh, that happen. Um, county staff, you know, stays on top of this relative to um, annual adjustments to look at cost of living, but periodically do adjustments in the program itself to reflect just where, you know, things were not projected years ago at a cost that was too, too far below what the market price is in terms of what we're seeing in bids and those kind of things. So that's where you have the uh, capital improvement program the roadway CIP was amended in January just for one line, just for this improvement cost. Um, and so everyone's fees went up um, to make sure that everyone who uses that roadway, all projects in the future, are paying their fair share. Thank you. Okay. Any, you bet. Any, any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, is there anybody in the audience that would like to comment on this project? Um, excuse me. Stephen Stearns, did you, what item did you wish, wish to speak on? Airport, thank you. Okay, is there anybody online or on the telephone that wants to comment? Okay. Hi, Michael, you have three minutes to speak. Hi, uh, Mike Arabedian. Actually, <clears throat> I star nine on the last item that was not called from the Y. Repeated the star nine. It didn't happen. Um, so this, uh, I don't have a comment on the extension of time issue, but I think that uh, all issues the planning department is looking at and involved in now, um, and I would say all, uh, including neighborhood impacts like this for unincorporated communities, rural areas, agricultural areas, Placer County Conservation Plan in particular area. I think the developments going forward in this area that have an impact, impact on agriculture and neighborhoods uh, 
need to be need a review. I'm not talking about just a general plan review. We need a concerted review to develop a policy that protects existing communities. And if not protects them, uh, doesn't uh, undermine their property values, their uh, community, um, community people move there and the reasons they move there and want to stay there without being negatively impacted by developments and so forth. So uh, I, I, I think it's time that uh, it, there is not enough here to be going ahead solely with a, a, a general plan, even though that's not the issue here, <clears throat> is not enough. And uh, I'm very concerned, one thing after another, and uh, the, uh, the the project approved for the tower is just a, an opening kind of um, example of the problems we have, the inability we have, the almost automatic running over the rights and reasons people live here now. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michael. And uh, be aware that we're just looking. Anything else from the applicant or staff? Any more questions? Well, you know, I, I did give the public a chance to uh, comment. Did you fill out a card or, you know, if you want to comment? We, we haven't closed public comment yet, so if, if you have an interest in speaking on this, you certainly may. Yeah, uh, you, you just would need to come up to the podium and please state your name. Yes, uh, I'm Rita Rojas, and I live directly under the flight path of the current. Oh, oh you're, you're on a different uh, project. Oh, you're not point. talking about that yet? No. No. Oh. Okay. okay well. uh, this is on the White Hawk project, which is a uh, housing development in Granite Bay. Oh, yeah. Coming up soon. <laughs> okay, so we're deliberating. I mean, the public comment is closed on this particular item. So we're deliberating now. If anybody's got any questions or wants to make a motion, you're welcome. Do you have a comment? I have no comment. Okay. Do you have a comment? I'm prepared to make a motion. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Commissioner, all right. It looks like you have a comment. So I no, no, I didn't. Did. I was going to make a motion. Oh, uh, go the ahead. The commissioner it's... to my left suggested that since this was my district, I do so. I Perfect. always respond to Nathan Hall. Nathan, that way, but <laughs> since you have uh, jumped in the middle, that's fine. Go ahead. I totally respect. No, I will Go be ahead, glad Commissioner. To second, I'll second your motion. You got it. Time. Okay. <laughs> I'll make a recommendation to approve the two-year extension of time request for the White Hawk One Conditional Use Permit Variance Investing Tentative Subdivision Map based on the previously certified Environmental Impact Report errata and addendum, and subject to modified conditions of approval based on the findings contained in the staff report. Second. Okay, the motion is second. Roll call. We have a motion by Commissioner Powers, a second by Commissioner Woodward. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Aye. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, it's granted. And so this, the extension would be appealable and uh, it would take a, a fee of $688 and needs to be submitted in 10 days here in Cedra. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to uh, Next item, and let me kind of preface this in advance a little bit. This this uh, item has been proposed to be continued, and so uh, that's what the uh, commission will be considering today. Oh, we're talking about the airport, right? This is Hidden Creek. Huh? Hidden Creek. Hidden Creek. This is Hidden Creek. The airport's out. Oh, 
okay. Sorry about that. I jumped the gun. <laughs> no problem. Okay, um, so yeah, we're on the Hidden Creek. We're on Hidden Creek. Uh, good morning, uh, commissioners, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the public. I'm Patrick Dobbs of the Planning Services Division, and this item is the hit proposed Hidden Creek subdivision reapplication. The uh, project site is uh, just over 19 and a half acres. It's located on the north side of Atwood Road, four tenths of a mile west of Richardson Drive, just here in North Auburn. It is located within the Auburn Bowman Community Plan. I mentioned it is a reapplication. This was first approved by the Planning Commission in 2009. There were four years of automatic state extensions uh, resulting from the, the Great Recession. Uh, that was followed by six years of extensions of time from the Planning Commission, and ultimately the previous entitlements did expire last year. The uh, community plan land use designation for the site is rural low density residential 0.9 to 2.3 acres, and the zoning is residential single family combining agriculture, combining minimum parcel site or minimum building site of 40,000 square feet, combining planned residential development of one unit per acre. Uh, this shows the project superimposed uh, in relation to its surroundings, particularly uh, the DeWitt Government Center. Uh, we're sitting in the Cedra building right here. Uh, so uh, the Government Center is adjacent to the east. There is rural residential development to the north and south, and there are approved and existing subdivisions to the west and southeast. Uh, the site is currently undeveloped. It's primarily oak, woodland, and grassland. Uh, the majority of the site is level, although there are some steeper areas up uh, in Dead Man's Ravine. That's shown in red. Um, the site is bisected uh, by the Nevada Irrigation District Combi Ofer Canal. That's shown in yellow. And there was an updated biological resource assessment completed by E-Corp consultants. There were no special status species observed during the uh, field observations, uh, but the site does provide suitable habitat, and there is some low potential for special species, uh, plant species, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and bats. Uh, the proposed Hidden Creek subdivision is an 18-lot planned residential development there's custom home lots ranging in size between 0.49 and 0.97 acres. The interior roadways are two 14-foot wide travel lanes. There's three foot of curb and gutter on each side, and there's a four-foot sidewalk on one side of the street. There are six open space lots. These frontage lots down along Atwood Road provide a buffer between the roadway and the development. Uh, lot C is the open space area that includes Dead Man's Ravine and the Riparian Corridor. There's an emergency vehicle access and utility lot to the east connecting with Wilson Way. And there are two uh, bioretention and water quality facility open space lots. The Combi Ofer Canal will be encased and undergrounded in coordination with uh, Nevada Irrigation District. Municipal water will be provided by NID. The uh, sewer service will be provided by connecting to the DeWitt Trunks uh, Sewer and it will require the project to annex in the sewer maintenance district number one. The applicant uh, really wants to create an upscale, upscale community. As I just mentioned, there is an emergency vehicle access through the site, so we don't want people to think that they can cut through and go to the jail or other areas in the DeWitt Center. So uh, a gated entryway is proposed to be installed along Atwood Road in the southeast corner of the project site. The entryway would be six feet tall, constructed of tubular steel, painted black. Uh, there would be split-faced masonry pilasters. Um, there is uh, frontage landscaping. This is a mix of native and ornamental trees and shrubs. Uh, there would be a six-foot meandering public trail and a six-foot tall masonry uh, sound wall. So uh, these illustratives are from uh, uh, Cabral Ranch. This is a recently complete, completed project in West Placer. For the most part, this is the same ownership group as Cabral Ranch, so these exhibits were used for uh, illustrative purposes. Um, there is a left turn lane that would be constructed for eastbound traffic along Atwood Road. 
Uh, regarding the analysis, uh, there are no community plan amendments. There is no rezone. The, the project's use and density adheres to the land use designation and zoning. Uh, there is potential for 19 lots, and that's a correction I kind of need to make on the record. The staff report said 21 lots, but it's a 19, half, 19 and a half acre parcel, PD of one unit per acre. 19 is the potential, 18 are proposed. Uh, the project is consistent with the zoning ordinance that exceeds the plan development requirements for open space. Uh, most of the lots are in the half acre range, and so the development standards are based on the B20 development uh, standards. That's a 35 foot front setback, 15 feet in the side and rear. Uh, there is a 36 foot height limit for the accessory or primary structures. But we also have specified standards for accessory structures and pools and such. So uh, we, we've given a lot of thought to uh, market expectations, and we don't anticipate needing to come back to you for 18 modifications as people want to put in pool houses or other improvements. Uh, as it relates to affordable housing, they will pay an in lieu fee. The project was uh, presented as an information item to the North Auburn MAC on November 8th, 2022, and as an action item on March 14th, 2023. Uh, the primary question from the MAC was why hadn't this been built yet? And uh, the, the main reason for that has to do with the timing in relation to the Great Recession, COVID, and those sort of market uncertainties. Uh, but the applicant has prepared an estimate uh, for the improvement plans and backbone infrastructure, and they are now ready to uh, uh, commence and diligently pursue uh, the project and recordation of the map. Um, there, were, uh, there was a question about the sound wall and how that would look in this rural setting and wanting to discourage the appearance of a walled off community. I explained where the sound wall was in relation to those uh, open space frontage lots and how it would be partially screened with the landscape and describe the materials. And following that, the North Auburn MAC uh, did vote 6-0 uh, with one absent to recommend that the Planning Commission approve the project. CEQA guidelines section 15164 provides guidance for uh, when lead agencies shall prepare an addendum to a previously certified mitigated negative declaration. And this is when some changes or additions are necessary, but no substantial changes have occurred to the site or the environment. So staff has completed an addendum and updated the project's mitigated negative declaration uh, with the resource categories listed on the screen. I would like to just dive in for a moment on the biological resources because I did have a member of the public ask me, how can a project uh, that has an MND that this, is this old comply with a PCCP? And so I, I mentioned that the uh, biological resource assessment, assessment was updated. So the PCCP land cover type, stream system, this was all re-delineated. And this is an important step that the applicant took that information and revised their lotting. They reduced the lot sizes to not only stay out of those protected areas, but stay out of the buffers. It saves them costs and PCCP fees, and it stays true to the intent of the program in terms of avoidance. There are updated mitigation measures uh, reflecting the PCCP covered activities, and you might be surprised to find out there are some things that aren't covered by PCCP, and those previous biological mitigation measures carry over. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, the project is conditioned to obtain PCCP author authorization. They will pay land conversion fees and special habitat fees for the developable portion of the site. And so this does comply with the PCCP in terms of avoidance, minimization, and mitigation principles. There are other sections of the addendum that required updates. Energy and greenhouse gas emissions didn't exist previously, but these will meet building code. and. Uh, this number of lots falls below the thresholds for greenhouse gas emissions established by the Air Pollution Control District. Uh, there's updates to hydrology and water quality, uh, transportation and traffic. As you're well aware, vehicle mile traveled is the new threshold for CEQA. Uh, there were also some changes to the design speed of the roadway, so that affected some site distance exhibits. Um, also updates to utility and service systems, particularly related to sewer and wildfire is a newer section for CEQA. So all of those were included in the addendum. <clears throat> because uh, the, uh, I, I should just mention the project was uh, properly noticed. We did receive one comment letter just this morning from PG&E, just making us aware of the utilities in the area and the needed coordination with, with their agency. Um, because the Hidden Creek 
uh, project would, would uh, construct a high quality subdivision that's located near good services and infrastructure. Uh, because the project is consistent with the levels of development that it's currently designated for and consistent with community plan policies, natural resources have been avoided to the extent feasible and or mitigated, and the project's environmental document has been updated to respond to current regulations. Uh, staff does recommend that the Planning Commission adopt the addendum to the previously adopted mitigated negative declaration prepared for the Hidden Creek subdivision project that's included in attachment D, supported by the findings in the staff report. And second, approve the uh, tentative subdivision map and conditional use permit for the Hidden Creek planned residential development project subject to the conditions of approval in attachment C. And I would like to mention one change. This is condition of approval number 115, which sets the expiration date. I thought we were gonna have it on the calendar earlier this month, it ended up on this date. Uh, so instead of it reading an expiration date of June 19th, 2026, it should read July 2nd, 2026. And, sorry, Patrick, just to clarify, oh, that date should actually go from today's date, so it would be June 22nd, 2026. So it currently says June 19th, and it should say June? 22nd, today's okay. date. Okay. So if, if, uh, if that could be included in the motion for the second action. And I would, uh, just before concluding, like to introduce uh, the applicant. Um, gentlemen, if you don't mind just standing really quickly. Tony Gallus is representing the applicant team on the left. Eric Crow with McCann Somps and Tyler Madsen are both uh, the project engineers. So the applicant team is here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can answer your questions. Go ahead. Just a comment, Patrick. Well done, as always. Uh, my questions were completely answered around PCCP and PG&E. Um, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question. Again, great job, Patrick, as always. Um, can you go back to maybe slide, I don't remember the number, maybe 14 where it showed where the NID canal in yellow was going through right there? Yes. Um, it's going to all be encased, but I see on lot 13, lot 9 is probably not a concern, but could that, is that going to be avoidable for building? And is, obviously it'll be easement through there if some happens to that canal in the future or that pipeline in the future. But you had mentioned people are going to want to put pools and pool houses in. Is that going to be in the way, or could that be moved um, into lot D, kind of a straight line that parallels lot 12 and 13 to kind of stay off their properties? Is that possible? If I understood correctly, thank you for the question. I, I think what you're recognizing is, is some, um, you know, unalignment between the graphic, but I, I think you're saying the canal encasement should follow the roadways and the, the utility corridors. Right. And I believe that is the case. Maybe I could have engineering or Eric, you want to come up and kind of confirm some of that? Um, yeah, I know but the there's an effort to keep it off the residential lot so okay. that there's not easements and we want people to be able to use their lots. Right. Good morning. My name morning. is Eric Crow. I'm with McCain Slime Civil Engineers. I've assisted the applicant with the uh, entitlement package. Uh, the intent is of the canal is to encase, um, and at, to the extent possible, we will be encasing within uh, lot D um, as well as within the roads to minimize the easements over existing uh, lots. There will be a, a minor easement on the rears of lots 11 and 12. It will go into lot D through the roads, out the, um, sub, or out the cul-de-sac that you see, headed west, and then follow the boundaries of lot seven um, and three to go back to its existing alignment. Um, but we have made every effort to minimize impacts to the existing lots, and they will be purely within the setbacks, so there would not be allowable development in those areas anyhow. So pools, et cetera, would, would not be able to be developed within those areas. So then that line will go through lot D, not through, I mean, Lot 13. Correct. The yellow is showing the existing alignment. We will okay. be realigning the encasement to follow lot D into the roadway through the existing cul or the proposed cul-de-sac. Um, it generally follows the yellow path, but it will be designed okay. to minimize impacts of those lots. Awesome. And how deep will that be? The, the depth is not 100% determined yet. It'll be finalized with improvement plans. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification. One thing that's important to note is that Dead Man's Ravine, 
it is fed with water from the canal. And I think it's worth noting that that hydrologic connection will be maintained. So the encasement will not dry that ravine up. So all the yellow will be encased. Is that correct? I mean, maybe not the portion in the very northern part up there in lot C. Again, the final details need to be determined with NID. But uh, certainly as it gets into the developable portion of the property. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, but, for, but, but yeah, so yes. for maintenance wise, yeah. Okay, great. <coughs> Thank you for that. Yes. I don't see any more questions. I might have a couple. <clears throat> Let me see. Uh, this, uh, this one through the PCCP, still, are you still there? Sorry. <laughs> I, um, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> Lost track there. You don't the hook yet. <laughs> Where, so what did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, uh, this seems to be... Uh, really one of the first ones that's really used in a lot of the PCCP uh, mitigation measures and environmental type stuff. And uh, I noticed that I was a little bit confused here in terms of land conversion. Now traditionally what, what has been required is, you know, of course people have to go out and measure the trees and then they, uh, they pay into, I guess, the uh, county fund for, uh, for tree, tree mitigation. Yep. And so in this project, it's going to be a little bit different. Is that correct? Yes. The yeah. PCCP, as opposed to looking at individual trees, uh, will basically assume that, um, that those trees could be removed through the land conversion fee. So um, any tree removal would be mitigated through the payment of land conversion uh, really th comprehensively as opposed to on an individual tree basis. Okay, so we're, are we moving away from the individual tree basis or? Uh, on projects that are within the PCCP. Yeah. Yeah, but there still are tree permits required for in other circumstances. But um, yeah, I mean, it, w it would in theory allow them to remove all the trees on the site. Now, typically, you know, owners don't want to do that, but that's the way the the program was established to make up for all this conservation that's being done in other parts of the county. Okay, so the money that's collected here will be conservation money that's used someplace else? Uh, it will, I presume, be used to acquire easements on areas that we want to protect and preserve. Yeah. Okay. And so is the PCCP, is there an organization or is that just the staff in the building that deals with that? Oh, boy, I mean, it, it, they are staff, but they are their own. I can answer that. Thank you. Uh, the, the PCCP is a conservation program that's overseen by the Placer Conservation Authority, which is a joint powers authority between uh, the county and the city of Lincoln and some other entities as well. So uh, the PCCP is overseen by the PCA, the Placer Conservation Authority. Okay. And so, uh, are there fees that pay for that, or? Oh, yes. Um, uh, Much yeah. like we were talking about with the capital improvement program, there is a PCCP fee that's um, included for development that would, uh, each project that comes in then would need to pay that prior to development, and then that would go to conserving uh, lands for um, yeah, preservation purposes okay. in the future. Yeah, the, I mean, the land conversion fee on this project off memory is 159000 That doesn't include the special habitat fees. So it's... And so that is a fee that goes to pay for the PCCP yeah. or to the... Yeah, that, P, that fee will be collected through the, from the PCA through this PCCP authorization. And that will be used to further the, you know, policies and programs in that, in that program. Okay, so it does go directly into land conservation, then it? Partially pays for uh, staffing and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the land conservation fee it does go uh, it does go uh, towards conservation of lands, but it, there is a staffing component that is paid for out of that fee as well. Okay. And so that's a, that's the fee that we're talking about that's being collected for the PCCP. So. That, that is required. Yes. Okay. You see one more question. 
And a, a part of the report, and I'm dealing with wildfire now. Mm. And in part of the report, the Cal Fire says this is a moderate That's right. fire hazard area. But the uh, document itself talks about uh, this this really not being a uh, really not being a problem in this particular area. And well, so I'm wondering I, what, I guess what my question is: What was Cal Fire's involvement in? Probably the statement on page eight or eleven. No, page yeah eight. Uh, you know, the, the, the fire district, uh, you know, reviewed the application regarding access and hydrants and such. Um, you know, as it related to the wildfire and this, the CEQA findings, there's nothing about the site that exacerbated wildfire conditions. It's not a steep slope. There aren't prevailing winds. Uh, you know, there is a management component to this open space area. So I, I think, uh, you know, this will actively manage the property and presumably reduce the wildfire risk, I think it'll have a beneficial impact in terms of wildfire. Okay. And so that was a statement that came from the, the fire folks. I, that wasn't, I'm, I don't want to speak for them, but that was the conclusions that we drew in the, in the addendum. And all fire conditions have been incorporated to ensure public safety. Okay. Okay, maybe one more question. Sure. And uh, the EVA gate, is that locked? Uh, yes. There are options for how they, you know, there's bollards, there's different ways. But yes, I believe it's going to be locked. Fire district, or they'll have a Knox box. They'll have access to the lock. <coughs> but it will be secured. And so that really won't provide access to the sheriff's office or the rest of the county project? I mean, Only in the event of emergencies, but as you know, sometimes people, you know, are looking for alternative ways. And, and so, um, no, it will not provide access, but, um, you know, someone might have to pull in there to find out, <laughs> uh, you know, whether it's locked or not. Okay. Well, kind of, and maybe I'll ask the applicant the question, that, you know, what's the purpose for the gate? Yeah, I mean, I, and, and I'll let them respond. I, I think, again, they're, they're trying to provide an upscale product. Uh, there is, a, you know, safety element. They're next to a jail. And like I said, there is this EVA where people might, um, you know, be, be, uh, be confused about their ability to cut through that property. So I'll let them explain their reasoning for it. I can just say that from a site distance perspective and safety element and such, we were able to analyze it, and it, there is no... Um, policy in the community plan that prohibits it and so um, it is one of your considerations today okay thank you yeah yeah now you can sit down thank you, 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 like, you, you back. <laughs> okay would the applicant like to uh, uh, address the Commission Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Tony Gallas, representing the uh, ownership group. I I really have nothing to add. I think Patrick has done a great job. I uh, had tried to work with uh, all the departments of the county that uh, get involved in uh, these type of applications. I really appreciate uh, them working with me in uh, that aspect. And I'm here only to answer any questions, should you have any. Okay, well, I, yeah, I did have a question on, there's, there's an idea of a gate at the entrance that, uh, you know, to, for just the, I guess, the people living there to use. And so uh, I just wondering what the purpose of that gate is, considering that if you drive around Auburn quite a bit, you don't mostly most of the subdivisions are open to the public. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, that is a very <laughs> uh, interesting question. We have been, uh, we, meaning county staff and uh, uh, companies, individuals on the uh, private side, I uh, have been, I don't want to say struggling with this, but uh, discussing this in, in uh, many, many different ways for long time. Uh, maybe what you just mentioned, uh, there isn't any 
gated community in this part of the county. Maybe that was one of the reasons. Uh, many, many questions uh, were raised uh, in this location, this uh, you can you can call it an enclave or something similar to this specific location of this parcel, uh, and the way it is situ situated, as Patrick described, uh, the uh, geography of the site it kind of opens itself up to this opportunity. I some time ago, when the previous tentative map was still in effect, I. I came back to the uh, uh, to the county staff asking, would it be possible? What would it take? And I uh, to, uh, to uh, construct a gate, make it a uh, more upscale community. I I the the response that uh, we have gotten was, well, you can submit it uh, in as part of the improvement plan. So it was maybe possible to do it then. And then as we were now working the last, I don't know, several months, uh, the question came back up again. Well, uh, is, it, is it maybe appropriate to uh, include gated entry? And so with a lot of this, well, maybe it's a good idea, uh, listening to the county uh, staff, county departments. Uh, the decision was made well, let's do it, and then there's no question uh, when I, uh, the project is being constructed, being built, then we don't have to go back to you and ask for that uh, change in the, uh, uh, in the project uh, design. I, I really wish I had a you know, more solid answer for you, but this really has been going back and forth with the county, county staff. But well, maybe this is a uh, good, good time to uh, introduce a nice upscale gated in North Auburn. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your comment there. Do you have any other comments you'd like to make? Only answer questions. Okay. Looks like we have no questions, and so at this time we'll open the meeting up to the public. Is there anybody in the audience that's filled out a slip of paper that would like to comment? Anybody online? Yes, we have someone online. Okay. Well, with that, uh, with nobody wanting to comment. Hello, uh, Michael. Well, there's someone online. Was oh, there? Yeah, we have someone. Okay. Hello, Michael. You have three minutes to speak. Oh, thank you. I guess I'm unmuted now. I was already talking to the wind. Uh, Mike Garabedian, Placer County, tomorrow. I'm not familiar with this. Hello? Yes, Michael, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, I am not familiar with this property or this project, so I can't uh, comment directly on it. However, I am going to comment on the discussion before the Planning Commission. Uh, first of all, in the Placer County Conservation Plan, uh, like it sounds like, I'm just guessing, the people on the Planning Commission know as little as the rest of the people, nearly everyone else in Placer County, about what the PCCP is and how it works. So I think it's critical that you get a full briefing. You couldn't do it in a half an hour, an hour. You need a full briefing about what the PCCP is and how it works. For instance, a, a critical aspect is the independent review team. These are the state and federal agencies, presumably with someone from the county there. Uh, maybe from PCCP, they review uh, projects in secret from the public. The public can't know about those meetings or go to those meetings. And then when PCCP uh, reports to the Planning Commission, or, uh, you know, that, that uh, goes directly to the Planning Commission again, not the public. And um, so this, this it really needs to be understood exactly what the PCCP is and, and how it works. Uh, and I may come back to that in a second. About gated communities, I think the important thing, the most critical point is that gated communities have either a very slight difference in governance from the rest of the people who live here, 
Uh, it can be a lot of difference or a little difference. I suppose it depends mostly on if there is a, a community association or something like that and what uh, conditions there may be on the properties in the area and access to the area. So the, the first question is, you know, j just how different is that community from the rest of it in terms of its governance by the county or, or other authorities? And in some cases, it seems re very significant. In other cases, not much more than a, a privacy gate. And I just, I just don't know uh, about this project. So I, I, I'm quite concerned about the, the PCCP. I, I, the, for instance, the, the, uh, the project, the, the job description of Mr. McKenzie, the PCCP director, says that he reports to the CETCEDRA director. Uh, so there seems to be a, a direct role there or involvement. Uh, but you, if you go to the desk of the, at the CEDRA office and ask to talk about the PCCP, no one will, no one will come and talk to you. So it's suggested as some kind of a special privilege removed from other planning in the county. And what, if you go there, they give you a phone number to call. If you go to the, there is an advisory committee. Uh, these are both meetings are very occasional, maybe every three months or every two two months, and these items never show up on the uh, advisory committee, uh, or rather the PCA itself, uh, that is made up of uh, the. Uh, two but Michael, people, your time is up. Counties. Oh, okay. But anyway, I hope that suggests that uh, the, the critical need for you to understand when you're being told what the PCCP does or doesn't do, that that's largely outside the public review and it needs, you need to understand it. Thank you a lot for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, is that it from public comment? Yes, we have no other. Yes. Okay. Did you fill out a, a sheet of paper or? Uh, I did not. Can I just introduce myself? Okay, and speak Wait, introduce just yourself on the matter? and we're on the this project. Yes, it, this, this, okay. this particular matter. Uh, my name is Troy Alessi. Um, I'm from North Auburn, Christian Valley specifically. Um, being a bit of a novice on this, I tend to concur with the online caller about the concerns about uh, the PCCP uh, and whether they're appointed officials and members that uh, run that or whether they are elected officials. Granted, they might be overseen by elected officials, but our disconnect from what them and their fees ultimately provide for the community are in question. Do the, does it set up a trust fund? Where are these conservation fees ultimately going to offset these upscale developments? Uh, secondly, I also tend to concur uh, with the caller's assessment that a gated community is in question here because I'm not sure that a gate necessarily equivocates to upscale. Um, and our community has generally been open, and I think that the cultural elements of what the community has established need to be considered, and that we don't need to set that sort of precedent going forward. So I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll give everybody a, one more chance. Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment. And so does staff any, have anything to add? Chair, if I could, I'd like to just provide a couple comments on the, the PCCP okay. and uh, Plaster Conservation Authority. The Plaster Conservation Authority is a joint powers authority uh, between the county and the city. Uh, two county supervisors sit on that authority board as well as uh, one city council member. Those meetings are public meetings uh, that the public is available to attend. Um, there have been discussions at the recent meetings about the endowment fund and where that fund, um, how that fund would be used to grow and the Placer County Conservation Program in specific identifies a future growth area. Um, that is where they anticipate development will occur within the county and they have a reserve acquisition area. Um, and that area is where they anticipate um, that area will be reserved to be protected from future growth within the county. And both of those maps are available online. The Placer County Conservation Program has an actual website um, that explains uh, basically what the program is. Um, there's some, I believe there's some videos on the website as well that explain that further. There is an advisory committee that also advises the Placer Conservation Authority. 
that committee is made up of community members, but they hold meetings um, every few months as well, and the public can attend those too. So if there is an interest in learning more about it, there are avenues to do so. Okay, thank you. Any more from staff? Yeah, I would just add that um, should the Planning Commission head down a path, I know there's conversation about the gated access, and should you head down a path of um, wanting to disallow the gate feature, there are a, a few conditions that would need to be modified, but we can work through that process if, uh, if the Commission desires. Okay, thank you. I receive uh, applicant. Do you have anything to add? Okay, thank you. Just to, wanted to give you an opportunity if you did have something. Okay. With that, uh, we're in the deliberations. And so, any comments or ideas? Or Can I just uh, make one comment about gated community? There was mention that there is not a gated community in this area, and within a mile from here, it's called the Summer Ridge Condominium Complex. It's a gated community. It's in front of Speedy Oil. It's been there for forever. I used to live there 25 plus years ago. So there is one gated community in the area that I've heard no opposition to in the past or before. And it is, um, they're proposing a gated community next to our jail. Our jail is great. We don't have any problems with our jail, but it is a perception that sometimes is made and perhaps that's a sense of extra security. So I'm not opposed to a gated community in that particular location. Okay. Any more comments? Didn't staff recommend the gate so they wouldn't have access to get through to another road and it's just kind of a deterrent so people wouldn't drive through that subdivision to get, I'd have to look at the map. I didn't. We didn't recommend the gate. We said, they wanted the option, and we said right, you need okay. to make a decision of whether you're going forward with the gate or not because we need to make sure there was room for people to turn around if they got stuck. Okay. And so it wasn't staff directing them one way or another in that sense. Again, there are no uh, you know, prohibitions in the community plan for that, but we, you know, we said if this is what you want, then, then let's put it in front of the commission. Yeah, I didn't mean that you recommended it should be there. That's not the word I meant to say. Sorry about that. Um, I just understood that it's kind of a thorough, it would deter it from being a thoroughfare to go through. I mean, that, that, that was some of the logic and some of the okay. reasoning going through our head. Again, their, you know, their interest in, in terms of the, the product, and obviously we're interested in a high-quality design as well. But as the commenter said, gates don't necessarily equate to right. uh, quality. And there is already a, a sound wall for most of that frontage. So... Again, it wasn't staff recommendation, but we said if, if you are going to propose that, these are the rules you have to follow. So even though if it's in there, they don't have to put it in. They can always, it's just, they don't have to come back. Okay. No, thanks for that. Okay. Any more comments? Yeah, I guess I'll just uh, myself address the gate somewhat because uh, it's been my experience on the planning committee. Oh. Well, let me, let me make my comment. I see the applicant standing up, but it's it's been my observation on the planning commission for the Auburn area that uh, the area doesn't really have gates, and and they haven't been encouraged here either. Though there's like I agree, there's nothing in the community plan that really prevents it. <coughs> and uh, you know I understand that uh, when we go down to the West Roseville area that most of the subdivisions down there do want a gate. And I know it's for economic reasons, upscale reasons. But uh, I guess in my view, uh, you know, if, if we're, if we're going to start making gates, gated communities in Auburn, then is that what we're doing? We're, are we trending that way or what? And so I would hope that we don't trend that way, to having a gated communities in, in Auburn. Because as you drive around, most of it, there's, I guess there is one, but most of it is uh, is open for for traveling around. So, anyway, that's my opinion on it. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Mark Mark Watts. Huh? I would just add to that. I think rather than doing it on a piecemeal basis, it needs to be more comprehensively looked at for the Auburn area. 
Yeah. Um, and perhaps other areas we may want to have that. So I would, uh, well, I probably have no real problems with gated communities. I don't want to be, be doing it one at a time piecemeal. So I'd like to wonder if there is a process that we could at some point have some feedback or amendments to community plans or suggestions for community plans as to how to deal with that and have it come back up to us at some point. Yeah, well, the, there is a, an effort to update the general plan, which right. will take into account the community plan. I know uh, in the uh, Granite Bay area, the community plan down there does actually prohibit grades, gates, but the uh, supervisors have approved some down there anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Commissioners, if I, if I may add, um, as, as uh, Chair Johnson did point out, uh, we are going to be updating the general plan as part of that effort, and as the Commission is aware, we will be doing a, a dive into the various community plans uh, with the discussion at the Planning Commission and with the Board about whether or not to amend, modify, delete community plans, and, and th that could be an appropriate, point, um, appropriate time to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I have to show my ignorance here. Mark, is this your district? Yeah. Whose district? Is this your district? Yes. yes. It is. Yeah. Okay, all right. Actually, yeah. share it somewhat with the huh? chair. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we can say three of us actually He's live got here. got more experience in this region than I do. Yeah. I've only got 10 yeah. years on the max. Okay, well, I, I see we have the applicant. Standing, uh, you know, the public hearing is closed, but since you're the applicant, if you would like to uh, make a comment, you're, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I do not wish to prolong it, just a couple of com important comments. The PCCP and Mr. Johnson, you probably know that better than anybody, that has been in the works for <laughs> decades. There's been tremendous amount of effort that went into it. Now that it's finally in place, and certainly people should know it, it has blessing from the federal and uh, state agencies. I mean, this is not something that was contacted last week, and now we have to live with it. That has taken so much effort, and it's finally in place for the betterment of the environment. So now having questions whether it's, is it appropriate, we need more time? It's, it's kind of a ludicrous way to look at it. That, that's one kind of important part to me. It is for the betterment of the environment. And the other, uh, Patrick mentioned uh, uh, relating this project to uh, Lower West Placer County in the, in the uh, Dry Creek area, uh, a project of 12 lots. That was also my project. And that had, uh, uh, Patrick mentioned, it's uh, 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 not exactly the same number, but it's, it's a lot of the partners that are in this project, and I'm not a principal in either. I, uh, quite a few of the same principles in this project <clears throat> were principles in the uh, Cabral Ranch. Uh, that has been changed into uh, t only t small 12 lot project with a gate. And so we've been using it, this work, it has been approved, that modification has been approved and the project has been built. The, the, same owners took it all the way through uh, and constructed it. Not the homes, but constructed the improvements. And it really turned out nice. That's why we have been using that as an example. That was done as a modification. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any more from the commissioners? Uh, just a side note on the PCCP, um, I've been out to a couple different sites that um, some landowners have been hit, and, with, hit with some extreme cost. Um, there obviously is some wrinkles that need to be worked out in the PCCP, and it is being done by the board um, that I've talked to. Um, so it is a good project, but there does there is some problems with agricultural lands and farmers being hit 
with extreme bills and extreme fees for modifying their agricultural land. So just wanted to side note, let kind of the general public know that as well. Okay. I'm not seeing any action from the commission. So is there somebody that wants to make a motion? I, I'd just like to, Mark, uh, what are your views on this gate? I mean, do you want to do an, uh, a modification to this uh, or, or not? Or, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you don't no, have that's opinion, fine. that's I have, fine. It's just I think your there's area. The staff has, has, has worked out, a, I think, a suitable solution that there's come back at a later time, as I understand it. And I think we just move ahead with this uh, recommendation here. And if there is more discussion to be okay. undertaken, I'd be glad to listen to that at that time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I'm, appreciate the um, the offer to let me have some flexibility on that. Just to offer my thoughts, I don't, you know, I'm I'm a little lost on why we might limit the gate. Yeah. I I don't. I mean, I, if it's not consistent with the neighborhood and community, I I understand that, but I I right. I'm a little lost on our findings as to why we might not allow this developer to put a gate in. Um, and so I, I would have difficulty in limiting that. I think if the market determines that it's necessary and the developer wants to try it for a small development, um, then they should have that right without restrictions in the community. Um, but I, I understand the gentleman up here sharing that um, he doesn't like a gate. I'd like to understand why not more and uh, uh, you know, Chair Johnson, I know that you also shared that. Um, I guess what I'm not familiar with is the limitations a gate puts on the community. Um, and I'd like to know more about that if I was going to limit the option the developer putting in a gate. Yeah, I guess I guess what my concern is, is uh, if we're going to start approving gates in the Auburn area, then, you know, it becomes a kind of the norm mm -hmm. and what I'm saying is in the past uh, in this area with the Planning Commission it uh, you know the the Commission and the county have kind of looked at keeping the keeping the areas open to the public and not having gates so do the Auburn people have an option to create a community plan that would limit that yeah I mean, that's what we're talking about there's a general plan of a jewel address community plans too that's yeah. uh, in the process and so it can can be it could be a discussion point there and should be probably mr chair so um i guess my question would be to ask there isn't anything anywhere in a general plan in this area that says no gates allowed it's just been sort of uh, standard, I know in, in the city of Auburn when I was on that council, we didn't have anything in there that said no gates were allowed. We just encouraged no gates. Is there anything right now that says you can't have a gated community in this area? We have nothing, correct? So, correct? Yeah, that's... That, 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 that's correct. Um, I did also just want to mention, um, I, I was a bit remiss in, if I don't explain that uh, in addition to the general plan, um, and, and I mentioned that we're going to be looking at community plans as part of that, there is a current update um, underway to the uh, Auburn Bowman community plan. Uh, there have been a number of community meetings and outreach done as part of that planning effort. This issue has not come up as part of that planning, uh, planning effort um, to update the community plan. That community plan will be at a later date for, uh, be brought forward to the Planning Commission before moving on to the board. But again, um, as you correctly pointed out, Commissioner Powers, this, this, um, there's nothing currently in the community plan addressing gates. Um, and if uh, it came up and, be, and when it was brought forward to the Planning Commission and Board as part of the update, that would be the appropriate time to, to do it, um, to add a policy related to that. So at this present time, we have an application for, to consider, so I say it correctly, for the reapproval of a tentative subdivision map that is meeting all of the requirements, actually exceeding the requirements in open space and 
items that they're doing there there isn't any reason that we could turn it down because there isn't anything that's saying that we can't except for if we chose as a body to say we don't want you to do it yeah i would say there's no current policy conflict with the community plan with the proposed project okay so in the future though for what uh, commissioner watts was asking for is in the future if we want to make that a standard, we would have to add that into these general plan updates and community plan updates, correct? Yeah, that's an option available. Okay, yes. thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, can you explain the, the timing on the update of the uh, uh, Auburn Bowman community plan? And yeah, um, the, the timing is going to advance prior to the general plan update. So um, if, if I had to guess, uh, I, I would say um, maybe within a year okay. or so, um, we will be bringing that plan update forward to the planning commission and then moving it on to the board. And you indicated previously on that update that the issue of gates had not been had not arisen so far. Correct. In any early portions of that assessment. Correct. Hey, hey, the public comment period is closed. I'm sorry. Well, are these private roads or as a tax Say, ma'am. Say, ma'am. We we road? have closed the public comment period. Okay. Yeah, for the people who are involved in this, you have allowed them to get up and talk back and forth. My question is simple: Is this private roads and this development is going to? May I ask a question, Chair? Well, uh, the, yeah, the public comment period is closed. We, we did get a major statement, but uh, I'd be I'd be interested if the staff could comment rather than the applicant because I don't want to give rise to more people popping up. Do you know what the concept that had been discussed, as the applicant indicated, with uh, the staff about the type of gated community? Because there are gated communities and there are communities that have nice looking standards as you drive into them that are more that that aren't a closed system but they have the um they have the feel of a gated community do you can you comment on what kind of discussions you had about the type of uh entrance i'll clarify that the roads are private but i'll let patrick talk to the aesthetics I mean, you know, obviously the applicant is really wanting to bring forward, a, and it is subjective, but what they view as a high quality uh, product for, for <coughs> North Auburn. And so, um, as I said, they, they, you know, have kind of been on the fence with the gate, and we just directed them to make a choice in it. Uh, but certainly, as I mentioned, the painted tubular steel, these CMU pilasters, I mean, it, it is intended to be attractive and whatever that implicates in terms of. So I'm still a little puzzled. So where I reside, there's a beautiful development at the end of Eagle's Nest that has a turnout that would allow people to come in, but the roadway is open and an open access. Yeah. And to me, something like that would not ever be an, an issue, but when you have access limited completely limited unless you have some means to enter is I'm just trying to figure out what the heck we're talking about is it an absolute closed gate system or is it a bypass system where there's a person that lets you through or is it a by bypass system that is just a nice looking set of pilasters I mean there is no guard house or something like okay. that so that would be a you know it would be a keypad entry or some other remote system okay um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of, in terms of the, you know. It sounds I, like it would be the type where you wave something and it opens up yeah, and you drive through. Right. But, but the, 
the bulb, if you will, the turnout is going to be there. And if they choose not to put the gate in, they don't have to do that. Right. And that sort of situation that you described okay. could still exist, but they wanted the option and we, you know, we, we brought it forward. Okay. Well, I leave it to the um, majority of the, of the commission to make a decision on the gate, no gate. You have a comment? Yeah. Um, this community, give it a gate or not, subject to county maintenance, is there going to be CC&Rs in this community? Is there going to be a group that's going to maintain the roads, sidewalks, and the gate? If the residents who eventually buy in there decide to have this gate, they can obviously vote to take it down if they don't want it. Um, so there will be, will there be CC&Rs on this community plan? Yeah, there are CCNRs condition. There will be an active HOA that maintains HOA lots and such. Okay, and thank you. Days. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'm prepared to go ahead and just make the motion based on the staff recommendation as is. So I'll go ahead and make that motion yeah. and read the pieces that need to be read. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And I move. The staff recommendation uh, that uh, the Planning Commission adopt the mitigated negative declaration and addendum for the Hidden Creek subdivision as set forth in attachment D, supported by the findings in the staff report. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We have a motion by Commissioner Watts, a second by Commissioner Woodward. Woodward. Thank you. Okay, roll call. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Aye. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I further move for the staff recommendation that the Planning Commission approve the tentative, tentative subdivision map and conditional use permit for the Hidden Creek Planned uh, Residential Development Project subject to the conditions of approval in attachment C and supported by the findings in the staff report. Second. I'm sorry, commission, commissioners, if I may, um, you would need to reference the revised conditions of approval that were read into the record by Mr. Dobbs um, related to the uh, June 22nd date okay. rather than the June 19th date. Can we add that yeah. clause to the motion? Thank you. Can I second that? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Roll call. Yes, a motion by... A motion by Commissioner Watts, second by Commissioner Woodward. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Aye. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? No. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That one took a little longer than we thought. Might have been my fault, too. I don't know. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to, you know, I, I jumped the gun earlier, but now we're going to deal with the airport overflight. But what I would like to preface this with is uh, what is being proposed by the county is a continuation, which means that uh, we have very limited information that's going to be presented today on this project and uh, if the planning commission uh, goes forward with it then uh, there will be a subsequent meeting that will come up where comments will be accepted now some people in the audience may uh, you know you came today with the idea that you wanted to make some comments and uh, you don't know for sure if you're going to be able to make it next time I don't know if you if you want to reserve your comments for when we have the full information that would probably be the best thing to do but if you're not sure that you'll be able to make it then I'll give you an opportunity to make comments today but keep in mind that you'll be limited to uh, to two to three minutes or maybe well you'll be limited to three minutes and uh, so just uh, please uh, pay attention to that and uh, how many people feel like they need to make a comment today? Okay, did you all fill out a comment card? 
They're on the counter over there. And so we have your comment cards, so. Huh? Well, they're over here on the table. You can fill one out. Yeah. And bring it right up here, give it to the clerk. And so at any rate, we have, let me see, who do we have here to talk to us today? Angel Green. Okay, thank you. Sorry, commissioners, before, before Angel begins, I, I did just want to mention um, that, uh, as you pointed out, there is a staff request for a continuance. Um, the, the agenda notes a continuance to June, thir uh, I'm sorry, to July 13th. Um, as well as the slide that's before you. Staff is uh, requesting that the item be um, continued to July 27th, uh, which will be the second meeting in July. I should also note that we will do a notice to all of the, um, a re-notice of the item to all of the property owners and people within 300 feet of the, uh, of the properties. So just wanted to note that. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Uh, yes, yeah, so Angel Green with the Planning Services Division. Uh, so staff is recommending uh, that your commission today extend the or continue the aircraft overflight rezone project to the uh, next available hearing date. Uh, this is due to an unfortunate error that occurred during the distribution of our legal notices where approximately 41 legal notices were not delivered uh, to the intended uh, individuals. Uh, the county is required by law to provide legal notice to property owners situated within 300 feet of a proposed rezone project, uh, as well as to those owners who are uh, the property owners for the parcels being proposed for rezoning. Uh, these notices must be sent out at least 10 days prior to the hearing uh, date to ensure that all affected parties have sufficient time to prepare and engage in the process. The extension would allow for staff to uh, work with our Doc Solutions Department uh, to rectify the error and to ensure that all property owners within the designated radius and those affected by the proposed rezone would receive the necessary information and ample time to prepare for the project's proceedings. We have received this last week at least 10 calls and emails from folks who did receive the public notice. Uh, there has been a lot of confusion as to what that pu public notice meant and what the proposed project intends to do. So with that, staff has made modifications to the legal notice that will be resent to all, uh, again, property owners within the 300-foot radius and those being proposed for the rezone. It will include a link to a dedicated web page that we've created uh, that will inform folks uh, with a little bit more information and detail that we're not able to provide in that legal notice. The, um, I did make available, because I do understand some folks might not have access to the internet, so I do have some flyers that I've left on the counter, uh, and I'm happy to, to talk with folks after this item as well. I can share with you that we have successfully mailed out more than 1,600 uh, notices. Staff did also send out in April an early intent, uh, or rather an early public notice of the county's intent to rezone. Uh, these parcels. There was also a sufficient amount of uh, outreach and public noticing that was part of the adoption of the 2021 airport land use compatibility plan. You know, I'm a little short of a presentation here and some detail as to what that plan is, uh, but essentially the county is required by law to rezone parcels that were part that were identified within that compatibility zone. Uh, that now fall within an aircraft overflight uh, combining zone district. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I understand the continuation date is July 27th. 27th. Okay. Uh, so I'm happy to, to answer any questions, or we can wait until the hearing on the 27th. Yeah. Let me see. Uh, maybe if I could uh, jump in here on maybe a little bit different subject. Normally I get reminded that... Uh, Decision, when a, decisions are appealable. And on the last one, on the uh, Hidden Creek subdivision, I forgot to do that. And so I just want to let the people that are still in the room here understand, and a lot of them really wanted to comment, that uh, 
that decision is appealable to the Board of Supervisors. It takes $688, and it takes 10 days. It, you have to submit it here at CEDRA in 10 days. So that's just your information. Sorry about that, that I forgot to, uh, I had a momentary lapse here, but sorry about that, Angel. Yeah. If there's any questions for Angel at this time. I, I have a question. Um, did you say that, I, I know we didn't notice everyone that we were supposed to, and it sounds like we were required with 300 feet of the rezone, people that are affected by the rezone. It sounds small <laughs> to me for an airport. Um, I'd be interested in expanding that. The 300 foot radius? Yeah. And not only to those properties that are being rezoned, but I think a much wider, uh, a much larger foot radius uh, to notify the community whether or not they're going to be rezoned the details about the process, I think is appropriate for an airport zone. Um, so I'd like to bring that up and get your thoughts if you consider that. Um, I, I might have a recommendation, you know, going forward if, if we're going to uh, continue this item, I think we should do better at notifying folks, particularly for an airport. So if I could just comment on that, Chair. So because there's an indication that uh, proper noticing wasn't provided to everyone, I think it would be legally deficient to continue to hear this item uh, um, beyond the request for the continuance. With respect to your concerns about are, um, are there enough people noticed, under the statutes, if you get to that point that over 1,000 people would require mail notice, then the statutes do allow a newspaper publishing of the notice instead. I might suggest that here because we likely will be getting to that range, or at least in that range, for purposes of noticing. So I may recommend that as an option. Then I would recommend that we put this in public notice in, in the newspaper for this project and to continue it. But I personally, I don't know how the rest of the staff feels up here, but for the people who did come here today, would like to mm -hmm. listen to what they had to say, even though we can't comment on anything yeah. and take any motions or anything like that. I just would like to hear what they have to say Great. so staff can um, answer those questions in before July 27th. Sure. Just to follow up that, you will need a motion to continue an action to continue it, but um, so we have that can be after public comment. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, Andrew, thank you. And so, uh, let me see, why don't we start over here on this side and uh, step forward. Oh, and, oh, oh, you're going to, okay. Yeah, she'll announce who's getting up. Sorry about that. Diane Wood, you've got three minutes to comment. Hello, thank you for uh, listening to a property owner who is an impacted by excessive air traffic, excessive corporate jets that fly over my house continuously day and night. The noise is horrible. I moved to Auburn over 25 years ago to not have this. I always knew there was an airport, but it was not heavily used as it is now. Uh, one other comment I'd like to say is that, do, do you understand that airplanes use leaded gas? It's not unleaded, but leaded. So the increase of the traffic over our heads are increasing our chances of a lot of different environmental um, problems. So um, I do not understand why we have gone to such an extensive um, overflight of this airport. I also wonder, in the middle of the county, the city owns the airport. There is no tower at the airport. Airplanes fly over my house extremely low, extremely loud, and there is no identification number under the uh, air jocks. So you can even complain to anybody from what I have found out from the state of California. It is just a little, little thing on the airplane. So the chances of the public complaining about the low flying people who get thrills out of flying over low houses, tipping their wings at you is insane. Um, I really think that the traffic should be halted. The development of this uh, increased noise pollution, environment 
uh, problem with the leaded gas should come into consideration since we all moved to Auburn for other reasons than to be exposed. So under environmental protection and justice, I complain. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Stephen Stern, you have three minutes. Uh, sadly, we retired here five years ago. I knew the airport was here. Uh, interestingly enough, we bought the home from somebody who represented Lion Realty. And when we walked up to look at the house, because we lived 130 <coughs> miles away, three and a half hours each way to get here, it was difficult to come and look at the property, although I did. And the planes were flying. I said, no, this is not going to work. She goes, oh, no, this is very unusual. I'm a pilot myself. There's very few planes. I live outside. I, I'm a lifelong martial artist and gardener, and I'm outside all day for five years. I have 100 videos of planes. I could throw a softball and hit them. I wouldn't do that. I've called the uh, FAA many times. It's ridiculous, like she says. Um, all a hundred times, what are you doing up there, my people? This is crazy. Uh, two weeks ago at 10.33 at night, a jet plane flew over. We live on a family compound with our grandkids, a daughter, my wife, myself, and our son-in-law just have a little over an acre. This jet shook the whole house. I thought the world was going to end. I called a kind uh, man at the city, and we discussed it. He knows me on a first-term basis. And Angel was very sweet to wherever she is. She was wonderful. Anyway, um, it's crazy. It's nuts. I have 100 videos on my phone of these planes flying. You can't talk. My grandkids are looking up like, what are they doing? And I didn't really understand about the lead of these planes. I'm outside all day doing my stuff. Um, I've lived in the country for 50 years and retired here knowing that the airport was here. But like I said, the realtor uh, said it was a small airport. Verbal contracts are not binding. You know, I got a million dollar house. Anybody want to buy my property? It's beautiful. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I'm just going crazy, you know. If I was inside and watching TV all day, that'd be one thing. But I, ain't, I, I had a business forever. I'm retired. I want to enjoy my life. The, these planes are crazy, and now with the new jets going, it's um, it's nuts. And if anybody wants to hear the recordings on my phone, I took three yesterday. Um, one at a quarter to seven. Like, what are you doing? Get a hobby. I'll, I'll, I'll teach you different hobbies. Anyway, thank you. Sorry to uh, vent, but I'm going crazy. Okay, thank you. Rita Rojas, you've got three minutes to speak. Okay, I live directly under the flight path, and I... I agree with this gentleman over here. If I'm sitting out on my back deck and I'm on the phone and one of those planes flies over me, I cannot hear and they cannot hear me. It's that loud. And I don't know about how low they're supposed to fly, but it is pretty low. And I have also noticed there's more tra air traffic than there used to be. It just used to be occasional small ones. They seem larger and louder, and there's more of it. And I'm, I'm thinking, why? I'm. I guess the thing is they're expanding their runway. Am I correct? Do you guys have that information? Okay. Well, that was my understanding from what I've heard around town, that they're lengthening a runway, and I'm. No, everyone can come to the conclusion that the only reason you would need a longer runway is so that larger planes can take off. Um, so that's really a concern to me. And it, it, it is, 
air pollution, as was said, as well as noise pollution. And it is very active. It's not just like one here and there. It used to be one here and there. I've lived here over 30 years in the same spot. And we are directly below. And, but other people can hear it. You know, you don't have to be directly below the plane to hear all the noise. And um, that's about all I have to say. I am concerned with our property value. If that area gets a reputation for being loud and noisy, and I'm wondering, is the city who owns the airport, are they going to compensate people when their property values go down? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. That's all I had to say. Okay, thank you. Tony Alessi, you've got three minutes. It's Troy. Oh, sorry, Troy. Hello once again. Um, I feel like this is a real life episode of Yellowstone. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that show. Um, but my family's been in Christian Valley since 1966. I myself have been a local resident since 1991. And I can personally state that my grandfather, having been in the uh, Air Force, um, we did go to the airport on occasion because they would fly in B-17s and B-25s, and it was a, a great thrill. And it was on very rare occasion that something like that would happen. Everything else were really tiny Cessnas, of which my uncle happened to own and keep his plane there. And again, he used it very infrequently. Um, my personal experience as a child progressing to now in my mid-30s that uh, ultimately the noise pollution is noticeable and it, it really shouldn't be given what my conditioning to the area has been like. Um, ultimately, uh, my Current residence actually happens to be outside of the zone, and according to what was being indicated earlier, uh, I believe I should be in that sort of notification and be given, you know, full uh, rights to be able to complain. Um, the narrow strip for renotification does need to be rethought of in terms of how it's ultimately noticed. In my opinion, I think the newspaper is generally a good idea. However. It's 2023 and most people don't even really have a subscription to a newspaper anymore. So alternative means I would think should be considered if at all applicable, like a PSA blast, just like the sheriffs use. I mean, this is of the utmost importance, especially to people's not only hearing, and I think of myself as a young guy who doesn't have much physical ailments, but I know that my mother is somebody who already has an autoimmune issue and she over the last decade has experienced a significant and like an exponential increase in health issues it it could be coincidental you know but it's just something to be given a certain amount of weight and uh, again just throwing spitballs out here for the board to consider not necessarily as a, a recommendation but given if you're going to allow for a noise pollution increase without some sort of remuneration or offset to that like a noise pollution lease of sorts to the residents so that way they're essentially given some sort of offset to whatever they're incurring for uh, personal mental emotional change to their environment that they're ultimately used to me included so I, I believe I speak for a lot of people in, in saying that I, I think a lot of weight should be given into how you guys consider what is appropriate for the ultimate expansion of Auburn, not just for the airport, but obviously the bigger scope of things. But okay, thank you. Tiffany Vander Linden, you've got three minutes. Commissioners, thank you for uh, letting me have this opportunity to speak. My name is Tiffany Vanderlinden, and I've lived in Christian Valley for, uh, uh, well, since 1996. I own eight acres there. I ride horses. I have an arena. I'm outside all day long. Uh, I, I, in the beginning, um, I love having the planes. I, I love the one day a year or the one week in a year when we have the air show. Uh, over the last several years, for me personally, 
uh, I've noticed a huge uh, impact in the flight pattern. So we get, and I'm outside of the zone uh, flight path. But uh, so it went from having the smaller aircraft who used to tip their wings and wave at me in the, you know, in the arena uh, to the Lear jets. And I believe that they've already uh, extended the air runway for, for Lear jets. So we only used to have one or two that came through. That's how, this is, I know this because I'm outside that much, uh, to several now. And it is, it is very noisy where I live. Um, and then we also have the commercial airliners that are above us heading to Sac airport, as well as anything that comes from Beale, uh, you know, another direction. So a couple of things, um, the 300 feet, uh, I would like to increase that to a mile since, um, that's where I'm about, uh, yeah, where I am in Christian Valley as the notification goes. Uh, with a thousand people, I think that there was something that you had said, County Council, about the, um, it would go in the newspaper. Many of us don't get the newspaper anymore, so I would like for it to go in the newspaper and for it to have written. Um, crashes. I know that small airplanes <coughs> typically do have more crashes. I have no idea with the Learjets. What is the demand uh, for the airport to have the runway lengthened on the Lear jets or the jets? And how would it affect our permits? I know when I got my arena, um, they, I had to look into the flight plan uh, when, with my grading permit. And so how would it impact getting a permit to you know, do something with your land? Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Andrea Suska, you have three minutes. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Andrea Suska, and I live in uh, northern Auburn uh, in Chatterock States uh, off Dry Creek. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, I agree with everyone that's spoken before me, uh, I'm just wondering if uh, your consideration for extending the airport is for commercial interest and not for public interest. If you're, you know, if you're bypassing the thoughts of the citizens here and just thinking about your uh, future revenue, I, I'm concerned about that. Um, and I don't understand exactly what the designation of our property will be, how it will be changing. Uh, you know, whatever it is now to whatever it will be. Anyway, I just encourage you to consider uh, the, the public here instead of commercial or whatever you're thinking. So thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. We have no comments. No other comments? And no, nobody on the telephone or the... Uh, we have nobody on the telephone There's either. There's standing up in the back. Oh. <clears throat> he said he pulled out a card. My name's Ken Jones. I also live in Shadow Rock, and I can tell from my hat I am a pilot. I fly out of Auburn. Um, in terms of public information, th th this isn't a picture of the Auburn Airport. Actually, it is the Auburn Airport, but I believe it's in Louisiana. Uh, not, not here in California. <laughs> um, to, to belay some concerns about pollution, air pollution, there's a federal uh, mandate that's been legislated by the Congress that all aviation fuel become unleaded. I'm not sure if that includes uh, jet aircraft. But for piston aircraft, within, I think it's two more years, maybe less than that, uh, all fuel has to be unleaded. So that may alleviate some of your concerns about air pollution. That that may still be. So talk to the commission, please. If there's yeah. any any uh, change in that, um, there there's also a precedent that the, the uh, board may think about, commission may think about, at uh, San Francisco, 
International Airport done a few decades ago, where the noise pollution became quite bad with the larger jets that were flying in and out, particularly one runway that took off from the uh, Bayshore Freeway and towards uh, Oakland. And when the jets accelerated, the noise was quite intolerable. And what they did is they worked with the airport to create a fund where homeowners who were being affected by that could have their homes uh, refitted with, I believe it was triple pane glass and other sound insulating materials that proved quite effective. So that's something the commission may consider. Um, myself, I, I actually prefer not to see a lot of larger aircraft in and out of Auburn Airport. I think the airport as it exists right now is, is uh, quite a nice community. I've flown out of different areas of the country, and this is the only airport of which I'm aware that really has a, a community feel where people spend time there, interact with each other, and not just pilots, but community people as well. It's not unusual at all for me to work on my plane and find community members walking on the airport, stopping by to talk to me about my plane. It's, it's going to be much different if, in fact, we do have a lot of corporate aircraft in and out of there because the airport will have to cater to them. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see. I think that uh, we have one more that wants to comment. Just... Okay. Not seeing anybody uh, jump up. Oh, no, just once. You just did once. No, no, I'm sorry, but you just, you know, if, if I let you go a second time, I have to let everybody go a second time. And so you'll have an opportunity on the 27th. Are we allowed to have a conversation? No. No. Do you like to prefer the Delphi tactic? No. I don't know what, what you're really talking about, but yeah, this is, this is a meeting where you communicate with the commission. And I think you're aware that we're making a decision on a continuance today and on july 27th uh you'll have another bite at the apple okay and so we'll have more information then and we'll be able to deal more thoroughly with uh, the issues that are coming up so i just wanted to give you a opportunity today since you showed up to I'm going to see we're losing power to show it up to uh, give a few comments. But uh, that's kind of where we're at. At this time, I'm going to close the public hearing and uh, bring it back to the commission. I'll make a motion to continue this issue to the July 27th Planning Commission meeting. I'll second that. Uh, okay. July 27th. 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 Okay. It's been changed to 27th. Um, the, yeah, you have it. It'll be a, a, a 10 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. hearing. Um, we'll likely have this item as the first item on the agenda, but it'll go out in the mail notice. Okay. S sorry, but before we can finish that motion, could we consider expanding the notification area uh, or making a recommendation that we do and including a broader net? I, I think it's it's. We need more public input on this topic. And we miss some of them. And I, I think that's problematic. I do. And, and I think um, expanding the notification, it's clear that pe some people showed up today that are impacted by this, mm -hmm. that are not in the notification zone. Um, and I'm really interested in expanding that. And, and so I don't know if we have that authority. Um, but I'd really like to expand the, the written notification to homes, really double 600 feet or even 1,000 feet, um, you, you know, or even wider. You know, I, I'm, I'm open to that. But I think the 300 feet is very minimal um, and only limited to those that have a zoning change. So I don't want to disrupt your motion, but I think this is an opportunity for us to, to do the right thing. And, and if I may, um, just as a point of clarification, as far as the, how the noticing is conducted, so all of the properties that are impacted by the rezone are provided the notice. In addition to that, it's 300 feet from those parcels. 
So there is a, um, a, a fairly significant area, but it certainly could be increased. Yeah. And also, can I, don't, everyone has the opportunity to give the clerk their email address and get included on any notifications that could happen. There's a way for that to happen as well, correct? So anyone in this room can get on that list and get notified. Yes, certainly staff is uh, prepared to notice anybody that would provide an email address to the clerk. And then my other question, which would be, Obviously, the airport is owned by the city of Auburn. And are they being invited to the hearing as well to participate, listen, communicate, give input? For example, some people in the audience mentioned things about, I don't understand why Auburn owns this airport. And certainly, we can give clarification as a county, but also hearing their, their input and their goals for what they're going to do with the airport, because they're the ones who did the master plan update and can answer a lot of those questions, including that the runway has not been extended yet at any given time. So they can help participate. I think it's a great suggestion. We'll make sure that we bring all of the um, uh, appropriate representatives that can participate in the uh, presentation and provide information to uh, to the public and also to answer questions that people may have as well. And to dovetail on that, it would be great if staff could also collect and provide the FAA complaints that yeah, are coming that's, in specifically. That was my next. And comment. I want to look at it over time. Have the complaints increased over time? And Just to I, note on Commissioner Herzog's comment, since since there was a concern over whether this uh, meeting itself was properly noticed, I am a bit hesitant to take any action beyond continuing it because it then may turn it into a, a hearing, that, an action an action based on a hearing that we took on this item that people weren't informed of beforehand. So I would suggest uh, that the motion only be to continue. I, I certainly um, I expect that staff has heard the comments with respect to noticing and, and we'll take that to heart in terms of providing for the project, but I would I guess recommend that we not take any action outside of continuing this to the next date because because of the noticing concern. And, and then we can hold you to that on the July 27th meeting, and we can ask specifically about notification, how you extended it, and then either continue it again if it wasn't yeah. to our satisfaction. Okay. Absolutely. Then I go back to my original motion. I motion to have this continued until the July 27th meeting. Second. Could I, could I ask a word for just a second? No problems with moving forward, but I just one question, and I don't want to lose the opportunity. Angel, what type of technical expertise exists on county staff to deal with aviation-related issues like this? Um, in other words, who are who you going to reach out to to uh, have, a you know, have a technical viewpoint on this um, you know airport hours um, airport uh, criteria associated with uh, approach and departure corridors um, you know noise abatement is, a, is it's it's always out there um, but there are methods that have been employed in a variety of different locations well not a variety almost every airport has restrictions um, associated with approach and departure corridors and things of that nature. So who is it that's going to provide you that technical advice? Thank you, Commissioner Woodward. So to answer your question, the county staff coordinates very closely with the staff at the Placer County Transportation, uh, PCTPA, Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, who acts on behalf of the Airport Land Use Commission. Uh, we worked extensively with them on the update to the compatibility plan, uh, which was just adopted by the Airport Land Use Commission in 2021. The compatibility plan lays out the criteria that's necessary for uh, development that's located uh, near the or within the proximity of the airport. It provides the, the uh, necessary setbacks, height limitations, and those restrictions. Uh, we do have staff at PCTPA that we regularly uh, convene with uh, to talk uh, on specific development applications that come in. For this item here, we worked very closely with David Melko, 
uh, who has been and has attended our previous presentations here on this item and will be at the hearing in July to answer any technical questions. Uh, but that document that I mentioned, the compatibility plan, goes through, uh, does provide extensive detail relating to the extension of the runway, the flight patterns, the number of flights, the types of planes that travel, the expected uh, traffic that's anticipated over the next 20 years. So that's really the, the document that we refer to, and then we work very closely with the staff there as we review development applications as they come in. Okay. Um, okay, great. Maybe if you're around, a quick sidebar after would be appreciated. If not, that's fine as well. I can catch you on the phone or an email. And I thank the chair for letting me ask that question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have a motion in a second. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go for uh, a roll call. Yes, we have a motion by Commissioner Dahlgren, a second by Commissioner DiMatteo. Commissioner DiMatteo? Uh, yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Powers? Aye. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Okay, with that, I think we're due for a five minute break. Yes. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, so, for the audience, we're, we'll, we'll pick up uh, our meeting after about five minutes. You're welcome.
Okay, everybody's kind of much on a sandwich, but I was wondering if we could uh, go ahead and get started again. And so I see we have a presenter that's anxiously standing there, sitting there and wants to talk to us. Uh, hmm. Okay, so good, good afternoon, commissioners. Again, Chris Pahuli, planning director. Uh, wanted to provide a, a brief introduction to this item, and then we do have um, a, a presentation that we wanted to provide uh, to you this, uh, this afternoon. Um, so as a, as a reminder, at the May 25th Planning Commission meeting, during the planning director's report, I stated that staff was intending to return to the Board of Supervisors with an item relating to Housing Element Program 42, uh, otherwise known as the permitting approach for the residential care homes with seven plus persons in single family residential zones. I stated that the item would include follow up information the board requested from last year and a draft ordinance for their consideration. At the planning commission meeting, uh, staff and the commission chair uh, agreed to agendize an informational item at this meeting to provide the planning commission with an update uh, with the understanding that a recommendation on this item was previously provided by the Planning Commission to the Board in July of 2022, and that this item was considered by the Board in September 2022, where direction was provided to staff to return to the Board with additional information. Staff has been working diligently to put together a responsive report package to, uh, to the Board for consideration and that date is tentatively scheduled for July 11th, 2023. Concurrently with preparing that board package, staff prepared a brief report to accompany today's update, uh, which was prepared prior to completion of the board package, which has not been published, but once it is, uh, will contain the action that staff is uh, recommending of the board, or requesting of the board. In working through the board report package and in drafting the ordinance, uh, it has been a bit dynamic and fluid, as commissioners can appreciate. And staff has determined that the report package to the board will not include a draft ordinance, but rather will provide a few options for consideration and seek board guidance at that July 11th date. I should note that this approach is contrary to the next steps section in the informational report with your package. Uh, but staff believes will make for a more productive discussion with the board on an eventual ordinance which will come at a later date after the July 11th um, hearing. I apologize for the mistake contained in the report, but we do have a full presentation and update for you that uh, Callie Kettinger Cecil will be providing uh, the Planning Commission on this item. However, before I ask her to deliver the presentation, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the commissioners might have. Why did you decide to do the discussion approach rather than the ordinance approach at the July 11th meeting? What was the reasoning behind that? Yeah, I, um, as I mentioned, it's been a, a dynamic process as we've started to put that package together for the board. Um, we've uh, evaluated HCD's guidance. Uh, we've looked at the various options that could be included in the planning commission, or I'm sorry, in the ordinance, the draft ordinance, including a very limited take on the uh, HE42, as well as some of the guidance that the planning commission has provided in the past, and thought that rather than putting that uh, draft ordinance to, um, as part of the package for consideration, uh, which if we did, we believe could also still be responsive to the original request, thought it would be more productive to just offer up options and let the board uh, direct staff as to which options to include in the ordinance and then just bring that back and we think that that will make for a, um, a smoother process on the, on the second hearing. Because one of the recommendations that we had made that I did not see in here was to limit the number. We didn't say never go over six. We said it's seven to unlimited that we had a big challenge with and that's not addressed in here. Right. Also, it recommends, it says that, I think it's Encinitas is one of the communities that 
um, went against this. There are many, many, many more. If you go into some of the footnotes that you have and you look at the documentation that is attached to this, which I did, it mentions at least 20 other communities and counties that have gone against this recommendation or have put a limit on the number. So mm -hmm. when you're doing this before July 11th, make sure that you do that homework. Thank you. Noted. Yeah, quick question, Chris, and I'm going to have a, quite a few afterwards, as you well know, um, for public uh, awareness. I know there is none, which actually is great. I'm, I'm actually, I hate to say it, but I'm glad that we are where we are. This will make for a much better, I think, uh, end here. But, um, uh, you know, I understand what you're saying about this, but um, the reason that we're going to do a workshop in my estimation, on July 11th, is because that's what the Board of Supervisors asked for. It, 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 so I appreciate all of the explanation. But what concerns me here is that, um, and this is just a general concern, and it's the only issue I was going to address with Kaylee, but I'm not going to do it now. I'll just address it with you right now. The other ones are going to all come to you. But uh, <clears throat> you, you know, it's in the staff report that we are literally going to take the original proposal that came to us in the first place to include an MUP, and you know, and and that is overturning what we said, okay? Ignoring it, that's in this staff report. It's been publicly noticed. It needs to be publicly withdrawn, in my view, because that's a publicly noticed document, and therefore it gives, I think, uh, the staff the authority to to bring this up, in theory, on the 11th of July. On the 11th of July, but in any case, the real point here is this. The reason you're going to do a workshop is because that's what they asked for. And there are at least nine other points that they raised in that meeting. So what concerns me is you're, you didn't connect the dots between the meeting in September on the 13th and the meeting that's going to happen on July 11th. And these are the board, this is the Board of Supervisors. That's a big deal. And, and honestly, as everyone knows, on the 15th of December, except you because you weren't here, I really poked the leadership in Placer County in the eye. And this is another example of missing a major issue. You know, if the Board of Supervisors tells you what to do, you need to figure out how to do it, not just miss the point here. So I'm sorry, but that's, that's why you're going to go do a workshop, because that's what they wanted. I think. Uh, one one okay. more, Chris. Oh. One oh, more, Chris. Yep. Sorry. Uh -huh. um, in this, in the updated whatever you're going to present to them, yep. please make it known that the planning commission. Uh, this is on page two here. It just says that we recommended these things. Tell, it was unanimous that we recommended against seven plus indefinite, and it was unanimous that we were for a conditional use permit. I just want that to be clear so that they know what we said. Thanks for the clarification. Was that unanimous at that no. time? It wasn't? I no, it was 4-2. No. Yeah. Yeah, it was 4-2. Uh, Rich was not here. I was four. Really? I was yeah, here, I think. I thought we were all agreement. No, you weren't here on that vote. Uh, well, maybe check it out it and let them know. Yeah, we 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 will make sure <laughs> to accurate, the accurately reflect Thank the you. action of the planning commission for the board package. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll now ask Kelly to come up and provide the presentation. All right, good afternoon, commissioners. Kelly Kedinger Cecil, senior planner with the Planning Services Division. The item before you this afternoon is an informational item on a proposed zoning text amendment or ZTA to enable the use of residential care homes with seven or more clients in the residential single family zone district with approval of a minor use permit or an MUP as directed by uh, housing element program HE42. The Placer County housing element was adopted by the Board of Supervisors on May 11, 2021. Housing elements require certification from the State Department of Housing and Community Development, also known as HCD. During HCD review of the document, several programs were added, including AG42 for group homes. And this program states that the county shall amend the zoning code to treat all residential care homes as family homes, consistent with health and safety codes, and to allow residential care homes with seven or more clients with approval of a minor use permit in single family residential zone districts. This is in the Placer County housing element, again, that was adopted by the Board of Supervisors in May of 2011. 
The zoning ordinance defines residential care homes as any family home, group care facility, or similar facility as determined by the director, providing for 24-hour non-medical care of persons in need of personal, super, personal services, supervision, or assistance essential for sustaining the daily living or for the protection of an individual. A residential care home serving six or fewer persons shall be considered a single family dwelling for all zoning purposes. Residential care homes with seven or more clients are currently permissible in the residential multifamily, residential agricultural, mixed use, and farm zone districts with a minor use permit. The proposed zoning text amendment for uh, residential care homes was initiated with the adoption of the housing element. The residential care home ZTA was included with a larger package of ZTAs in 2022, which I will refer to as the 2022 ZTAs. As you may recall, the uh, 2022 ZTAs included a, minor, a number of relatively minor changes to the zoning ordinance. The 2022 ZTA was, was presented to the Planning Commission on two occasions, including as a workshop on May 14th, and again at a public hearing on July 14th. Sorry, May 12th was the workshop, and July 14th was the public hearing. The Planning Commission recommendation was to disallow residential care homes with seven or more clients in the residential agricultural and residential single-family zone districts, and instead allow residential care homes with seven or more clients in the office professional, neighborhood commercial, and general commercial zone districts. The 2022 ZTA presented to the board was not modified to reflect the Planning Commission recommendation on this issue don't, uh, due to known implications. These potential implications were discussed before the Planning Commission, and, and the Planning Commission's recommendation, though it wasn't included with the larger ZTA package, was discussed at length uh, at the or in the written staff report in addition to the presentation before the board on September 13th. Uh, implications of noncompliance were discussed, including potential state decertification of the housing element, loss of potential funding opportunities, potential civil action from the state and housing advocacy groups, as well as amending the general plan and the housing element. Staff received direction from the board to confer with HCD, verify the likelihood of consequences resulting from noncompliance, return to the board with a workshop to include supplemental information and recommendations. After that hearing, staff met with HCD and learned that HCD was in the works of developing a, a group home technical advisory memorandum. They were developing this memorandum because there was a number of local jurisdictions that had questions about how to comply with housing element law as it relates to group homes. This document focuses primarily on uh, housing types for disabled persons, but also covers a number of residential care home types and discusses how policies should be complying with planning and zoning law, housing element law, affirmatively furthering fair housing law, anti-discrimination and land use law, and fair employment and housing act. The memo also provides guidance that local governments are obligated to comply with state housing laws, that such compliance includes implementation of a certified housing element, that development standards can be applied to the extent they are not discriminatory towards protected characteristics as defined by state law, and are also applied to all other residential uses in the same zone district. Uh, group homes are an umbrella term that just includes a number of uh, shared living residence types. Group homes, uh, certain types of groups homes, Shared living residences, 24-hour non-medical community care facilities, alcohol and drug facilities that provide treatment, and group homes for children all require licenses from the state and are referred to as licensable group homes. An example of a group home that's not licensable from the state would be a, a peer support home that does not provide uh, the level of care that would require state licensing. Uh, so the HCD memo notes that discretionary permits can be required for group homes, and those discretions would need to consider the following uh, when such policies are being crafted. So the memo specifically identifies uh, these considerations, including do the policies comply with housing element law and affirmatively furthering fair housing requirements? Do the policies and practices unlawfully discriminate based on disability or other protected characteristics? Do the policies ensure compliance with state and federal law? And finally, do the policies remove constraints on housing for persons with disabilities, affirmatively support it, and prevent discrimination against it? 
In addition, the Group Home Technical Advisory further notes that Group Home policies should avoid the following in order to prevent potential for discrimination, including spacing requirements or community density restrictions, otherwise known as a cap on the number of residents, operator and residence requirements, parking requirements beyond those required for residential uses, occupancy restrictions, visitor restrictions, records maintenance, codes of conduct, for-profit, or commercial operator restrictions, and finally, policies should not overly scrutinize living arrangements. Discretionary permits can be required subject to written and objective standards, provided those standards apply to other residential development in the same zone district. To further clarify this, uh, spacing can be required, but only for very specific types of group homes, such as those that are providing respite services for minors or respite congregate care for terminally ill patients. As I noted, parking standards can be required, but only to the extent that they are uh, similar to other requirements for residential uses in the same zone district. Same with development standards in terms of occupancy limits and written objective standards. Um, all of those things can be required, provided that they are applicable to all housing in the same zone district. Staff did confer with HCD to determine what the potential consequences would be if the county did not comply with HE42 as adopted. And HCD staff confirmed that such an amendment or non-compliance with the housing element may result in revocation of HCD certification, loss of our pro-housing designation and associated funding opportunities, legal action from the state attorney general, HCD, as well as third party housing advocacy groups, and financial penalties. <clears throat> this year, the state has taken action against jurisdictions over issues of noncompliance, including the city of Clovis versus Martinez, Bonta versus Elk Grove, and the people of California versus the city of Huntington Beach. They're specific to uh, other issues that are um, in general over... Correct, but I'm providing them here just to demonstrate that the state is uh, taking serious legal action and is very closely watching what jurisdictions do uh, with regards to compliance with housing elements. And Kelly, if I could just make a quick note on that. The Martinez versus City of Clovis case, that was published in April, so just a couple months ago. That one is noteworthy because that's the first time that we've seen a court directly also take up the argument that failure to comply with the housing element is a discriminatory action. Um, there was kind of inferences to that in the city of Encinitas letter, and there was, there was kind of a perspective from H, there has historically been a perspective from HCD that these were discriminatory, but that city of Clovis case now shows the court also weighing in and providing input that, that in fact HCD's perception of this as being discriminatory is, is also being applied in the, in the court forum as well. Thank you, Clayton, for that clarification. Uh, when staff returns to the board with a proposed ordinance, there are a number of potential findings that would need to be made, and those are summarized here. I'm not going to read these word for word, but I will summarize them. Uh, the board would need to find that, an, that a proposed amendment would further the housing element goals to remain in compliance with state housing laws in removing barriers to development. That the county is a pro-housing jurisdiction and the zoning text amendment exemplifies how the county is taking steps to enable a variety of housing types that can be built for its residents, that the state is facing a housing crisis and enabling the use to be more permissible in more zone districts provides an important housing opportunity, the population growth continues and a variety of housing types are needed to accommodate this growth, that the residential care homes with seven or more clients is a land use type that provides a range of group homes including for seniors which is an, an increasingly important consideration given that our county does have a larger a population of people over 65 than the general statewide population. And finally, that the proposed amendment has been reviewed against state housing laws and the HCD technical memorandum in order to ensure compliance with state laws and interpretations. I would like to note that there are a number of non-residential non discretionary uses that are permissible within the residential agricultural and residential single family zone districts. <clears throat> These uses include surface and subsurface mining, uh, event centers, golf courses, parks, playgrounds, cemeteries, uh, medical services, heliports, wineries, etc. And I'm providing this information just to demonstrate that these zone districts are not strictly limited to residential uses. 
Uh, so um, prior to today's hearing, we did receive one public comment from Defend Granite Bay, and you should have received that letter prior to today's hearing. Um, when we return to the board with, a, uh, with the workshop, we will, be we will be discussing potential options for the board. That includes option one, which is what staff is proposing and discussing today, which is strictly adhering to HE42 uh, in the adopted housing element, which would enable the use to be permissible in the residential single family zone districts with approval of a minor use permit. Option 1A, which is that same amendment, but um, adding another amendment to require that minor use permits in residential single family zone districts for residential care homes must be heard by the Planning Commission. Option two, uh, which would be option one plus the Planning Commission recommendations to include the use in commercial zones in addition to the RA and RS zones. Option three, which is amend the housing element, require a conditional use permit in the residential single family and residential agricultural zone districts. And option four, which is forwarding the original Planning Commission recommendation to amend the housing element, remove it from RA and RS, and instead only allow it in the commercial zone districts. In conclusion, we will be returning to the board on July 11th uh, to present this information as a workshop to the board. And interested persons can submit written comments um, or provide uh, virtual comments by sending them to the addresses shown here. So with that, I'm available for any questions and happy to answer them. Thank you. Can I go first? Yes, sure. you can. Can you go back to slide 34, please? 34? Yes, please. Right now, the policy that is in place for most of these residential care homes, not all, not, not considering the sober living facilities that aren't licensed, they now meet the state laws and federal laws. You're asking if our current zoning ordinance meets the state and federal laws? It, I would say yes, but we also are required to implement the housing element, which includes HE42. Correct. But Department of Public Health um, Community Care Licensing Department still has a, a limitation, especially for children, of it being six. No more. So how do those two jive together? If Community mm -hmm. Care Licensing says no more than six children in a group home, that's our rule, and we have all sorts of public health and safety standards around that. How is zoning for that going to allow something that the state of California, Department of Public Health, doesn't allow? So any of those uses, we need to get a license from the state. We're not saying that if a residential care home came in, they would have to go over seven. If a residential care home came in and they wanted to um, have more than that and it's not allowed by the state, our zoning ordinance would not... Um, trump that specific, you know, those uh, public health and safety laws. And what is the reasoning for not having a limitation, not saying 7 to 10 or 7 to 12, instead of the more, it's the unlimited mm -hmm. number. What is the hesitation in, in limiting that? So the hesitation isn't one that is um, coming from staff. The hesitation is, is really, the HCD has found that when you are imposing different limitations on different uses that that may have a discriminatory effect. So the staff report um, specifically on page four, uh, discussion of issues, does note this. Um, and really what they are looking at is not so much whether, um, whether jurisdictions are allowing the use with seven or more clients in single family zone districts. Rather, the state is asking jurisdictions to examine their housing policies to ensure that a jurisdiction does not impose separate requirements. It's the separate requirements that the state has determined um, if, they are if there are standards that are imposed on uh, residential uses that are primarily used by protected classes as determined by state law, then those that would be required for other residential land uses is a discriminatory effect. My question, too, is that some of these care homes are businesses. Mm -hmm. They are licensed, profitable businesses. So we're allowing businesses to operate in our residential areas. Right, and as I uh, had mentioned on, what slide was this, slide Golf 39? Courses. There are a number of non-residential uh, uses that are permissible. Um, in addition, I do want to note that um, residential care homes is not the only land use type that certain facilities could fall under. The zoning ordinance mm -hmm. also discusses 
uh, medical care, extended services, as well as senior housing projects. So if a project came forward and there was a determination that a project actually fell under one of those different land uses, then we would apply the uh, standards that are set forth in the zoning ordinance accordingly. And this is a good slide because the difference, I think, and we're talking about residential single family, all of these requirements on the right side have parking requirements. Mm -hmm. These won't. They would have the same parking requirements that are required for all other residential uses. Great. That leads into my point. Um, I volunteer every week at a residential care home for children who are both delinquent and dependent, adjudicated both. Um, they're foster kids who are also juvenile delinquents. I went through the log last week because I have to sign in every week. And we dominate the parking in this neighborhood in Rockland. We take up every space for a half a mile. We have to walk forever because the kids come back. Some of them go to school at JDF. Some of them go to school in a continuation high school. They all come back in the afternoon. These are who visit them. They're so social workers. Six kids, six, six different social workers. Occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists, mental health techs, pharmacology techs, psychologists, tutors, canine therapy volunteers, CASAs, six of those, probation officers, Four of them have probation officers. Family visitation, their family can come at any time that they like to visit within reason. They have activity coordinators, they have EIP specialists, they have two house managers, two full-time staff and eight part-time staff, plus DPH CCL staff that come in to license them. Those are all just in the afternoon mm -hmm. that dominate this neighborhood. This neighborhood has complained for years about this to no avail. You increase the number, because this is a for-profit, business that does this. They, they generate $32,000 a month per child that they get paid through Kaiser. Um, and this, if they, if they can grow, they will. They will expand as much as they can. Buying a house in the neighborhood to them doesn't cost them as much as they make in, in their business model. So I'm concerned for the neighborhood that it, it, it'll just run rampant. So similar to um, residential uses, if there was an instance where parking was not adequate based on the parking ratios that are defined by the zoning ordinance, then that may be a code enforcement issue and that use may need to provide additional parking if it is so found. That parking would have to be based on the same ratios for single family residential. They've tried that yeah. over the years. It just hasn't been successful at all. Okay, That's, I have nothing else. That's all. Is there a limited amount of MUPs and CUPs that can be distributed throughout a certain neighborhood? Or could it, like Robin stated, could be overtaken? You know, you'll buy two or three houses. This is a for-profit business. It's cheaper to go buy houses at that rate. I could buy three houses in a row, and now mm -hmm. I have 30 people plus staff living where it's designed for four people, maybe. So, unfortunately, um, spacing requirements or those kinds of um, limitations are really frowned upon by HCD. They view that as unless you're going to be requiring that for every single residential use in the same zone district, the HCD memo was indicating that Im imposing different standards for this specific use may have a discriminatory effect because the types of residences of these facilities tend to be those that are under protected characteristics as defined by state law. Can you go back to Page 29 first. I, I thought I saw something, but I just want to yeah. clarify it in my own head. Um, and then page 37, please. It says in one of these that we'd lose funding. <laughs> Would the county lose funding, but the company who's running this lose, obviously they probably wouldn't lose funding, but what are the ramifications of funding? If we don't have it, we don't need the money, as far as I'm concerned. Like so earlier, project. sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Um, earlier this year, the, the county received designation as, as a pro-housing jurisdiction. And that designation is important because it unlocks or enables the county to be eligible for a number of potential funding opportunities through grant programs that are funded from the state. So if we lost that pro-housing designation, then we would lose our eligibility for those funding sources. So when we raised from 7 to 10, as an example, and that means we could potentially be as well, we could potentially said no, that wouldn't be possible. Or if we were out of compliance with HE42, 
That doesn't mean that they would make us not pro-housing. They haven't said that, right? We would not lose that designation. They haven't said, if you're not in compliance with AG42, you will lose your pro-housing designation. No one said that. They have indicated that that may be one of the implications that may occur if we are not compliant with our housing element as adopted. Not just, I'm talking about one little baby element. Yeah. Okay. They haven't said it. They may have, and they indicated. Got it. Isn't so that's, that a, that's what, a no. Isn't that what point number two is? Loss of pro-housing designation? Potential. Potential. They just said implicated and may. It hasn't been tested, I don't believe. Has anybody tested this one little tiny element? If someone hasn't been in compliance, did they not get their pro-housing designation? Uh-uh. No, um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, there are very few um, pro-housing designations across the state. Um, the, I should note that the uh, Placer County was the first um, county to receive a pro-housing designation. Um, and there is also a letter attached in the report package from HCD that uh, indicates that that is a possibility if we do not comply with HE42 that they could that they would um, remove that designation. What percentage of sorry, Anthony? You were no, there. no, you're fine. Um, what percentage no. of funding would that remove? 0.01 percent, 10 percent, 50 percent? That's a really good question. I'd be happy to look into that and get back to you. Yeah. If it's negligible, then as I recall, and I could be wrong, as I recall, the pro housing. The current pro-housing program has $26 million funded in it. And you have to apply for those dollars. And what so percentage of that do we get? I, I haven't yeah. the foggiest. Right now, as Chris points out, there's uh, it was Sacramento County and Placer County and then a couple of cities, as I recall. And that may have changed since that time. But that's... That's the pro-housing program as it currently exists. Yeah. I think um, I would also add that, um, as, as uh, Commissioner Woodward mentioned, there was a, a, a pilot program for funding, uh, but the state has also indicated that there are a number of other uh, funding programs that, that there may be preference points for jurisdictions that are a pro-housing designation. So it isn't necessarily just limited to housing it could be transportation funding or other funding sources that may be as as Callie mentioned unlocked but with that pro housing designation yeah. no that's fine I, I cherish what you said in this because you know more about this than me for sure um, on the actions at the bottom of this page city of Clovis Elk Grove aren't those related to SB 330 and does SB 330 can it tail or H E42 tail off that where those these things can go in those designated areas where now we're looking to change zonings for low income housing and could we kind of preference where we would or can the county or city preference where they want to go if we have to go that route and change land uses and put in housing where we can only designate HE42 implications in those zones and keep them out of residential neighborhoods? Is there a way to do that? I guess look into that. Yeah. Correct. So just like HE42 can go anywhere, but can if we're rezoning districts or rezoning properties that are owned by private citizens, is there a way, I guess, I'm shooting at the stars to try to locate these in a residential facility or area instead of, you know, because I guess they don't want them in commercial zones. Um, so would we be compliant in that area as well and not have to go deal with, like, what Martinez and Elk Grove and City of Huntington Beach is doing? Because they're obviously against HB 330, and they're fighting it, and they don't care to pay the fines. Um, so a couple things. Um, first of all, HCD hasn't said that they don't want to see this use in commercial. They are much more concerned with the use in residential zone districts. So if we wanted to add it to commercial, as long as we're also including it, as described in HE42, HCD <clears throat> doesn't really have an opinion one way or the other. In addition, um, SB 330, which is known as the Housing Crisis Act, uh, may apply for residential care homes, so long as they fall under the state definition of housing development. That definition is that a housing development is defined as a project consisting either of residential units only, 
mixed use developments consisting of residential and non-residential units, or transitional housing or supportive housing. For a mixed use development for these purposes, the Act requires that non-residential uses be limited to neighborhood commercial uses as defined and to the first floor of buildings that are two or more stories. Uh, the bill also, um, a really important key consideration of this bill is that it uh, reduces the time frame required for review, which is one reason why a minor use permit is preferable. It also limits the number of hearings to five. Uh, but, uh, the bill specifically states that, um, that it reduces the time period in which a lead agency under these provisions is required to approve or disapprove a project from 120 days to 90 days for a development project generally described above and for 90 days to 60 days for a development project that meets the above described affordability conditions. And when it's referring to the above described, it's talking about the paragraph preceding it within the bill. Um, the other thing I wanted to note, uh, and this is getting back to what Commissioner Dahlgren was saying in, in terms of caps to the number of units, um, HCD has said that uh, community densities for these types of facilities may be a discriminatory effect and that policies for group homes should avoid that potential. I would note that if there are concerns over um, spacing or, or density, there are other uh, land use types such as senior care facilities that, are, um, that do require a conditional use permit and perhaps those larger residential care facilities if they're providing non-medical care and it's limited to seniors, perhaps that is a more appropriate land use. For the purposes of today, you know, we really wanted to um, bring back what we've learned from HCD. And a lot of the questions that came from the board and your commission were things like, can we have caps? Can we have parking restrictions, et cetera? The HCD memo is pretty clear that those things can be required provided that they are applicable to other residential uses within the same zone districts. Um, so today, uh, staff is discussing these things. Um, if there's other questions that I can answer, happy to do so. Yeah, I, if I can just add on um, real quickly to what Callie just said. Um, in, in addition to um, the correspondence that's attached to uh, your report package and which will be forwarded on to the board. Uh, there was also a request because obviously a lot of a lot of what we're presenting is information that is gleaned from the technical advisory and our correspondence with HCD. Uh, there was a request from the board that we have HCD uh, present at the hearing. Uh, that was included in my correspondence as you saw to HCD. They've been uh, non-committal, I'll say about whether or not they will attend the hearing. We will be following up with them to inform them of the date of the hearing and urge them uh, to attend the hearing to provide testimony at the hearing. But I um, wanted to make sure that you are aware of that as well. And, and I just wanted to clarify, I am very supportive of these types of homes in mm -hmm. our neighborhoods. They exist now. They provide an invaluable service. They're so important. They're members of our community and we need to serve them. The challenge is, and I don't think a lot of people understand this, is we, Placer County is becoming a magnet for these homes, especially from Southern California, especially for children who are in substitute care, who the state is the custodian of, who can transfer them anywhere. So a lot of the Southern counties now, because they can't afford it, because it's super expensive down there, are transferring their kids up here. We have the services, we have the land, we have the space, we have relatively affordable housing compared to Southern California. And the profit margin is higher. If you're, the state is only paying, or Kaiser or whomever is only paying 30, some odd thousand dollars a month per kid, you get a lot more bang for your buck up here. So more of these homes want to open, they want to expand, they want to increase as much as they can, they want to buy up homes in neighborhoods that are a little depressed. And it's not a, an opposition to having these homes in our neighborhood, they exist now and they're really excellently run, perfect, wonderful organizations, but we're becoming a magnet for them. And I don't think you all know that or understand that. And housing and development doesn't care. Why would they care? And they're businesses. We're running businesses in our neighborhood. Right now it's a business with two full-time staff people, eight part-time staff people, two house managers, and six teens or children, whatever. Then they're going to buy the house next door, and then they're going to do 10, and then they're going to do 12, and they're going to get licensed for it because HCD is allowing this in terms of zoning, and it's just going to snowball. And Southern California is looking so forward to it because we're getting all their kids now. We're getting all their kids now. So that's all I have to say on that. Can you go to the list of reasons why a decision might be discriminatory? 35. 35. 35. 
So this this list to me um, is a question because sometimes I think it might be easier to have a list of things that aren't considered discriminatory <laughs> to be helpful. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. that it's yeah, it's almost um, <laughs> difficult to find one, but I, I can find reasons why these are not discriminatory. They're just good health and safety practices. But what I don't know if it exists is a stressor on emergency services. Is that in this list? So if they're, uh, you know, these uses, like I said, they're, the intent is that they are complying with the same standards that are required for residential uses. Yeah. Um, this does not, dis or this, when I say this, I'm sorry, I should clarify, I'm referring to the group home technical memorandum. It doesn't discuss um, stressors on emergency services that and, I recall. And I do think that's a serious issue, and I don't see it in this list. Um, but, you know, the stressors on our community uh, with a number of people in homes, any age, any issue, um, I think is very serious uh, and, and almost a deal breaker. Um, and so I, I, there has to be a cap. I, I don't find any way around being able to quantify the amount of services needed and the impact that has on a community without knowing how many people are in a space. So because we would be requiring a discretionary permit, we would know by virtue of that of how many people are being proposed. Um, as a discretionary action, approval is not guaranteed. So if there was a proliferation of these uses and your commission felt that it was becoming too large, for example, no. No. However, the um, if an item is controversial, it could be forwarded to the planning commission. In addition, items that are heard at the zoning com administrator can be appealed to your commission. In which case, there would be uh, multiple potential um, hearings. So, all of our hearings are publicly noticed. Um, so, I mean, it's the zoning admin administrator hearings are a valid hearing body. I, I just I just want to say that if an area to make a decision on that isn't discriminatory is emergency service stressors, I, I'd encourage us to pursue that and think about that realistically for our communities uh, to think about how many people can be served um, and, and a limitation, a limitation, because I think it's a good health and safety practice. Um, and care out of all, care for all people that might exist there. It's not a discriminatory thing to care for anyone that might be there because the service might not be available. That's why the, uh, the licensing limits exist now. Yeah, it's for care and safety. So that that's that's I guess that's a point that I wanted to make today. Um, it's hard to not, you know, be offended when staff doesn't bring forward a recommendation to the board that was made by the planning commission. Um, and so uh, I appreciate you bringing this informational item. It's very helpful uh, to know what the findings are. Um, but I think, you know, I wish we had an opportunity to really have a vote. Uh, so the residential care home um, zoning text amendment, as I mentioned, was brought to your commission last yeah. year twice. Um, in addition, you know, we did discuss your recommendation. We didn't bring it forward because, as noted, that recommendation would have required amendments to the housing element as well as amendments to the general plan. And the board also wanted to learn if there would be potential consequences to our programs if your recommendation had been adopted. Yeah. So as I've... I know. Right, that is what the state has told us. To grant a CUP or MUP, can't you put restrictions on or limitations on occupants like you do to have winery event, 50 people, 40 people, 30 people? If I apply for a conditional use permit, doesn't the county have the discretionary line to say, sorry, you can't have more than seven people because your facility is not big enough? Yeah. So, so Or a minor use permit. So those... Um, 
types of standards would be applicable to the standards that are set forth in the California Building Code. So the California Building Code sets out how large um, or what the occupancy is based on how large a room is. So if uh, someone came forward you know, to get a building permit, they would have to comply with those building permit standards for occupancy. I, I would just want to make one comment because I think it's, it's, um, it's relevant to that discussion. If when you read HCD's current guidance on residential care homes, all of the guidance indicates that these should be treated the same as residential single family homes. So I think it's a logical conclusion that, that it, from HCD's perspective, they would like residential care homes of seven plus to only be zoning clearance. They would prefer not to even have a minor use permit. I think it's probably somewhat of a bit of an anomaly that HCD signed off on our housing element with a minor use permit, given at least the current guidance that you see from HCD. So a minor use permit has benefits in that it is a discretionary approval that allows the county to still impose conditions. I, I would, just a bit of a hunch, but if we had a housing element going in front of HCD right now, my assumption would be that they would likely tell us that a residential care home of seven plus would have to have only zoning clearance. We wouldn't even get that discretionary process. So it's just something worth considering at least. And I'm, I'm by no means I'm saying what's right or wrong. I'm just telling you what right. from HCD's perspective is um, required and necessary for these but entitlements. Clayton, they just produced a memo that did not say that. What do you mean? They just produced a memo that we have in this package that did not say that. Well, he's saying we got in under the wire. That we got it in. But they just first. produced a memo, policy across the state, that does not say you can't do an MUP. Right? That's right. correct. It so does not are, say why anywhere. Why are we sitting here making assumptions about what HCD thinks when HCD just told us? Well, uh, in the memo that they pr provided, they talk about residential care homes of seven plus being the, treated the exact same as single family residents. And specifically, and I have a county council statement on this from you that says a CUP or an MUP is not prohibited. That is absolutely correct. And as long as that same requirement is applicable to all residential uses Fine. in the same zone district. So that right. would be if someone wanted to build a single family residence in a single family zone district, they would be coming to your body for a conditional use permit. Okay. We're saying that if there's a family of 12, we can't say no. It's just the same as a residential care facility. It's not. A residential care facility is a business. In some cases, is an actual business operating as a business, as a for-profit entity with all of the things that go with it. It's not a family of 12 living <coughs> it next door. But HCD. And HCD doesn't see it that way. They HCD, don't care. They don't care. They don't care. They're just trying to meet their numbers. They're trying to be compliant. Right. We're looking at out for the neighborhoods and for our neighbors. But they can't go put 12 people in a two-bedroom, one-bath house. They could if they, it was already built. They're not asking for the permits. It's already built. They can buy it and move in. Yeah, Why but don't you, doesn't it? Why couldn't they? No one's going to stop them. There's no housing yeah. police. But when you go get your permit, doesn't, I guess, that there's no ramifications. It's already built. They, no, buys if you get your MUP to go move in your 12 people into this residence, there's, oh, I guess I there's nothing. Oh, I thought you meant just a family of 12. No, no, no. Family, you get a family well, of HCD 20. Well, HCD wants to tr it's... treat it the same way. They want us to treat a family of 12, family of 20 moving into a house the exact same. Am I right? Well, this says spacing requirements. I, th maybe I think you're exactly restrictions. right. Is that, uh, there is no exactly spacing right. requirement. HCD yeah. fact, wants it to be unicorn utopia. Yeah, there was a court right. case on this particular issue in Michigan or something. A court case on this particular issue that said, hey, you know, we've already got an existing ordinance, and I can't recall the specifics. It said, you know, you can't put uh, 22 people in 250 square feet. Well, you know, that would be logical. And the court overturned it, didn't they? Something along those lines. I mean, I don't remember the specifics, but I corresponded with Clayton on that as well. And the hospitals are going to be the next in this business, by the way. The hospitals are already outsourcing this to the profits and the non-for-profits. And now the hospitals are finding out they can do it in less restrictive environments more cheaply than they can, obviously, with inpatient and obviously without paying the profit to these for-profit, non-profit. So hospitals are next in this business. FYI. I, I'm sorry. Thank you Anthony. for Go ahead. Go ahead, Anthony. I got sorry. It. No, are you done? No, I'm done. I'm done. I just I want to say thank you for all of Yeah, thank you for Yeah, the thanks. It was very helpful. You know, Kaylee, well, I've got, I've got some things i got to say. Yeah, let, me, let me do one, too, okay. here, I guess. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, SB. Yeah, so, uh, your mic. Your, your mic. If it's an affordable housing project, um, otherwise it's 120 days. 
Oh, it's affordable. So it's SB 330. So in HD, this doesn't apply then, right? Well, it would. Um, so the bill. Um, Uh, requires or not requires it reduces the time period in which a lead agency under these provisions is required to approve or disapprove a project from 120 days to 90 days um, for a development project generally described above and from 90 days to 60 days for a de development project that meets the above described affordability conditions and those affordability conditions are tied to um, income levels so if a uh, yes. residential care home came in um, and had some kind of affordable component to it, and that affordable component complied with SB 330, then the uh, review time would be reduced. Otherwise, the review time is reduced from 120 days to 90 days. This bill also uh, discusses the number of hearings that can occur for housing development projects and limits it to five. Yeah, so I think just to add to that, I think the upshot, and I know the commissioners that were at the um, League of California Cities Planning Academy training um, heard a lot about SB 330, but the upshot is that the uh, discretionary permit, whether it's a minor use permit, conditional use permit, whatever the, the, the permitting approach would be, would be subject to that streamlining uh, provision in SB 330, so the action would need to take place within likely a 60-day period, um, but perhaps a 90-day period, mm -hmm. depending on the project. Well, the thing that strikes me there is that, uh, if I remember, you have 30 days to uh, accept the app, or say that application is complete, and then you have 30 days to consider it. And you're limited to five hearings, and uh, likely what's going to happen is a uh, CUP is not going to work, because going to take longer than that and it, after the after the final 30 days then the project approved is what I was hearing yes. so it's not even discretionary anymore it's done so I mean that's what I'm hearing but that's what I'm a little puzzled about I guess how the how these all work together but so I think the one way to make it work is just move really quickly on those hearings um, you can still impose conditions as long as they're non-discriminatory provisions and assuming you can get your hearings done within the time frame put forth, the 90 days or 60 days. But that, that does require uh, fast movement on the applicant yeah. and staff's part. Could it be found that it's discriminatory to the people who already live in that residence? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, discrimination is a broad if term, right? So, you know, anybody, so can that bring in lawsuits from current residents and say, hey, look, you're discriminating against my neighborhood by bringing in 25 people to live here? When we're only zoned for single-family residents, and this is not a single family, this is a business. And, so. dove, and dovetailing on what Anthony was saying too is that, I'm sorry, not Anthony, Nathan was saying is, you know, the emergency services. If it's an elderly home, then you've got ambulances and fire, EMS coming in and out. Assuming with the um, dependent delinquent home, we've got sheriffs there all the time because the kids abscond, they go down to the river to buy drugs, come back. I mean, that happens at least once a month. And then we get fights, the police come because it's a non secure facility. So there is a tax on the emergency services in those areas. I mean, don't, don't we want these homes? By the way, I have a niece who's 50 years old who lives in a, in a group home. She's lived in a group home in Manchester, New Hampshire for basically her entire life. Group homes are fabulous. They're great. You know, but, but we want these people to assimilate into a community. If you shove them into a community where they do not belong, they will not assimilate. They will be resented. You know, it is just, this is such a screwed up policy, it's almost mind blowing to me. Mm -hmm. We need to get HCD to come over here. If they're waffling, we need to say, stop waffling, grow a spine, and show up, people, because they have got to defend this. It's nuts. This is a terrible policy. We're going to have a new governor pretty soon. Right? So one it's thing, not gonna, I don't think it's matter. One it's thing matter. I would like to know is that in terms of discrimination as it relates to state housing laws, um, that's a very specific term. And uh, when they're discussing discrimination, it means that jurisdictions cannot establish policies or practices that discriminate on the basis of disability or other characteristics as defined by state law. As noted on page 17 of the Group Home Technical Memorandum, a discriminatory effect 
is generally established through statistical evidence showing that a policy or practice actually or predictably results in a disparate impact on a group of persons with protected characteristics or that it perpetuates segregation. And just for reference, a protected characteristic means race, religious creed, color, national origin, ancestry, physical disability, mental disability, medical condition, financial status, housing status, marital status, sex, age, or sexual orientation. And I, you know, I don't claim to know uh, if that would be broadly applied to every single thing, but as it relates to housing laws, there is a very specific definition when it comes to discrimination. I just wanted to make that clear. Sure, and that's really important. However, HCD is saying that if we make it a conditional use permit, if we just by virtue of making it conditional, by coming before us, that's discrimination without even a decision by us. So they are saying that the difference, imposing different standards is the discriminatory effect. Even though so it's a business. But So if you do one permit, you set them all the same, then it's not considered discrimination, right? So if resident A right. and resident B are the same under the CUP, that eliminates the discrimination. Right, okay. under HCD's guidance, if you had a single family residence, uh, that was required to get a conditional use permit, then you could also require the same of a resident. For a family care. of 12 who moved in next door. You'd have to require that of any family of any size. That's We'd have to make the standard. It's just a house. It's just a house to HCG. Right. Anybody can live there for any reason. Thank you again. Yes, not thank be, you. Not, not to beat not, up the not messenger. On you. <laughs> not on you at all. Yeah, yeah. and listen, I, I'd like to, I, need to, I need to make some points here. So um, I'm going to actually say this because it's... There's nobody in here, which is great. I got uh, four words of guidance from my supervisor before I came here, and it says, do not get fired. And so I wrote this down, and I have it in front of me. So I'm not going to get fired. But the really great thing is that my colleagues are going to make sure that I don't have to get fired, So which is which I am super appreciative of. Which ones? Us. Yeah. 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 Even, even you, even, even the bearded one. But here's the thing. Uh, Unless you're you know, still here when I'm the supervisor. We, 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 we work together very well, I think. Uh, you know, obviously, I've been on the losing end of some of these arguments uh, over time and stuff, and that's okay. That's really okay. But this one here uh, really is a concern, I think, from a county perspective. It's frankly a concern from the state perspective. Uh, if anybody wants to stand in front of me and tell me that I'm, a, I'm an inherently discriminatory person, they're going to have a real problem. And the fact of the matter is we've all been appointed by our supervisors. You know, to sit here and make judgments about land use decisions all the time. And I want HCD to come over and explain why it is that having a CUP or an MUP that uh, automatically reverts to us by policy, which by the way is authorized by code and is one of the options that uh, Kayla mentioned, which I think is fabulous by the way, uh, is an inherently discriminatory policy. That's baloney. You know, we are not an inherently discriminatory body. We have a right to do these things in this county. And we, we, need to, we need to fight this. So I am asking my colleagues right now to do exactly what I'm going to do, which is make sure my, my supervisor is well aware of the concerns that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so because, because we need to fight every once in a while, we actually need to fight as a county. I get it, $26 million at risk, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe but, $10. We don't know how much of the $26 right. million is at risk. Right. So, you know, sometime you've just got to say, no, we're not going to do that. We've got to actually stand up for ourselves and fight. But in any event, yeah, a couple of different things real quickly here, okay? Um, and, and you know what? You have suffered through this. I have pummeled you before. <laughs> so I'm going to pummel Chris now. And I told him I'm going to pummel Chris. Some of this he may revert to you on, but you know, just real quickly here, just a couple of quick things. Chris and, and Nathan mentioned this briefly. How is it that this organization makes a decision by majority vote and then you overturn it when it goes to the Board of Supervisors and do not present that as the recommendation? Now, your predecessor sat right there in a public forum and told me and everybody else, that the, that the recommendation presented would be the recommendation that we provide. So I want to understand what authority we have, or are we just an irrelevant body here? If we vote and you guys decide, well, I don't want to do that, we'll just go ahead and present something else. And literally, it's in the staff package written that way. You're going to present an MUP, and you're going to do 7 plus and anywhere you want to. That's in the staff package. It's been noticed that way. So how is it that you can just overturn our decisions. 
So I think the is the question the item that was presented in September of last year that was not what the planning yes. commission recommended. Yeah. yeah. And so EJ I, sat there and told me it was going to be the specific. Yeah. Uh, and again, thing. I apologize. I think I believe at the last meeting where we talked about this, I think there was some confusion about what actually was brought forward to the board in September um, of, of last year. Obviously, I, I wasn't there. Uh, for that um, for that September hearing, uh, but I think as Callie mentioned uh, during her presentation, uh, what was advanced to the uh, to the board uh, um, was the discussion at the planning commission. Um, uh, the, the component related to uh, the planning commission's recommendation, as, as I understand it, and I, I did go back and listen to the to the hearing, and so I know that there was. Discussion that if the if the um, board was to proceed with the planning commission's recommendation, that it would need to be repackaged as to a uh, housing element uh, amendment, a general plan amendment, and um, you know the changes through the yeah. ordinance. And so, uh, again, I wasn't here for that September um, <coughs> September um, action or the the July hearing that the planning commission had, uh, but at least that's my understanding of why what went forward in September was different than what the Planning Commission recommended. Okay, but let's go back Actually, to, go on, I'm sorry. I might be Wait. able to provide some input on this because I was here for the Planning Commission part and the board part. The recommendation of the Planning Commission was brought forward to the board. Um, and specifically, let me read the action request of the board in that September 13th hearing because I, I think it is relevant. Um, and this is action item four of that staff report. Direct staff to review the county's general plan housing element program, HE42, relating to residential care homes and return with proposed amendments to the housing element and zoning ordinance to disallow residential care homes with seven or more clients upon approval of a minor use permit in single family residential zone districts, but allow them in commercial and office professional zone districts. And I think the reason it was worded that way is because in order for staff to return with a zoning ordinance that removed them out of residential um, residential districts and then move them to office and um, uh, commercial, there actually needed to be a general plan amendment done with it as well. And the general plan amendment would require zoning, zoning uh, going through the, the municipal advisory councils, the planning commission, and the board. So it wasn't just as simple as bringing an ordinance forward with planning commission's recommendation because it also needed to be tied to a uh, general plan amendment and an amendment to the housing element. So the direction brought forward to the board was, if this is the way the board wants to go in line with the planning commission's direction, then we need to go back and modify the housing element and bring forward a general plan amendment along right. those lines. So that was the direction, and from my perspective, that was directly bringing forward the planning commission's recommendation. So um, there was no kind of uh, staff decision in between of, okay, do we bring this forward or not? And, and I believe EJ's comment about bringing forward the Planning Commission recommendation, that is something staff has been true to since I've been here, and that once the Planning <coughs> Commission makes a recommendation, that's what we bring forward to the board. There's no um, staff decision as to whether or not that should be or should not be brought forward. Okay. I would, I would concur that it was discussed. I, I agree. I've watched it three times. I would concur it was discussed. Kaylee okay, discussed it three times, or did, did discuss it. I agree with that. So, all right. Uh, I, However, it was not, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, do we need, Clayton, to, since this is a publicly noticed document that talks about an MUP going forward and that sort of thing, uh, under next steps, do we need to actually publicly notice a retraction of this next steps section? You're, you're talking about the next steps that talked about bringing right. forward. Right, so this, says, this says point blank. Uh, this says point blank at the hearing, which is the next hearing, okay, so July 11th. At the hearing, the board will consider adoption of a zoning text amendment, allow residential care homes with seven or more clients with approved of a minor, a minor use permit in accordance with Placer County housing element. That is not accurate right. because we're going to do a workshop. workshop. Does this need to be retracted? No, I, I think uh, Mr. Pooley's comments in front of the commission today clarified that, and I think as is the as the agenda is a public document and this meeting is a public forum, his clarification in a public forum is um, sufficient for those next steps. I do think it would be different if we had identified that as an action requested um, going to the board and the staff report. 
But this information today was an informational item and the, and the staff report was explaining what would be in terms of next steps. The, the board report for that hearing has not been provided. <coughs> the notice if one is needed has not been provided. So there hasn't been any indication beyond the direction to your planning commission in terms of what, what staff was intending for next steps. There hasn't been any kind of legal notification of this is what's going to happen. Okay, so all we're gonna do is workshop. Kaylee, uh, you, you indicated there were four options that were gonna be considered or brought forward to the workshop, but yeah, there was no slide in your briefing on that. That's correct, there was no slide on the briefing on that. And the other thing I wanna um, just point out, Commissioner Woodward, is my name is pronounced Callie. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> okay. I, 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 it's, a, it's an unusual name that gets mispronounced Yeah, all the my time, apologies so. then. No, it's uh, all good. Absolutely. Um, so, mind. yeah, happy to reiterate those options. So, um, option one would be strictly adhering to HE42. I'm sorry. Could we just get them sent to us? Yes. Okay, that'd be great because that'd be very helpful. Um, and for everybody's, uh, for everybody's information, county code has in it um, uh, you know, if you look at CUP, MUP, that section in county code, there is a section in there that says the house, the zoning administrator or the planning director can, if a policy uh, issue is significant, refer uh, any MUP to the board or to the commission for action. So my suggestion was that yes. uh, since we're all freaking out about whether we should re redo the housing element, which I absolutely think we should, but if the board says that's just too much of a risk, why can't we just simply say that everything by policy, the, the board says it's a policy that if you're going to deal with a seven plus, it must come to the planning commission. And you indicated that that was going to be an option. It's already in county code and we should not have to adjust the housing element under those circumstances. So. HCD never knows we did anything. It all comes through us, and we can make decisions uh, as a planning commission under those circumstances. Now, Clayton, you indicated in your note back to me that if we did that, you would, uh, it, it appeared to me, we would have to notify HCD. Why is that? It's a standard policy we have in place right now. We're just applying it. So I don't know that it necessarily needs to uh, affirmatively notify HCD. But I do think if HCDB, HCD did learn about an official board policy along those lines, they may view that as, um, in, their, in their view, discriminatory, discriminatory. or spe special treatment of a residential care home, along the same lines as, um, as a zoning text amendment. Kelly, is that one of the options that you have of your four it options? Is. It, yes, one, it is. Which number is that? Option 1A. Okay. Because yeah. some of the questions... And it's a little, if I may, it, it is a little bit of a, of a nuanced um, version of that. Um, so what we were thinking is that maybe it's a minor use permit with some sort of note in the table that the minor use permit would be heard by the Planning Commission. Yeah, it so it wouldn't change clear. the minor use permit. Right. Um, but again, as, as Clayton mentioned, and I think we will disclose to the board when we meet with them, um, through the workshop that um, that there is some potential for concern, um, but but that could be an option to to consider. And our supervisors are also, mine specifically, really wants to understand the consequences. And I know you right. don't know them all, and I know HCD is keeping that close to the vest because they don't want everybody to know that. They're not showing you their weighted scale of HE42 gives you 10 points, and they don't want you to know. They just want everybody to do everything they say, yeah do it exactly the way they would say it, and then we'll bring the hammer down. We haven't figured out what the hammer is yet. So the supervisors are also confused. You guys are confused. You want to comply. The state is putting down this big, huge housing crisis package of laws and regulations and programs, and you're just doing your job. I get that. But the supervisor's like, wait a minute. We get some control, some dis decision, some discretionary powers of our neighborhoods, and perhaps a minor use permit coming to the Planning Commission is a way to do that and not discriminatory. Mm. Yeah, and, and the neat thing about this is, so for my, uh, for, for, for the fellow commissioners, the neat thing about this in my view is that we don't have to tell HCD, we don't have to change the housing element, and we at least put in the hands of elected or appointed officials, in this case appointed officials, some control over what we're dealing with here. 
Mm-hmm. So from, from my perspective, when I talk to Suzanne, this will be my minimum. This is the minimum. Uh, I think we have to go much further than this. And frankly, I think we need to make HCD take us to court. I'm done. This is stupid. You hear that, this Clayton? is terrible yeah. policy. Uh, it, Get ready, Clayton. A, this is a ridiculous policy, almost. But, but, uh, but at the end of the day, I'm not a supervisor. So I'm going to tell her that in the hip pocket, the bottom line minimum should be policy, establish a policy, and bring it to us. And then we can at least talk to them. You know, right now, we just did a CUP to put a wine bar, okay, to put a wine bar in Tree Lake Village in a commercial area. Good point. You know, a CUP. Good point. Now, we could put 22 of these homes in the middle of Tree Lake Village in a residential area with 14 people in each one of them with an MUP, and we're still discriminatory. Yep. It's ridiculous. (laughs) It's just... I, I think anyway. the county council would love a county with a big, deep bench of a lot of lawyers to, to be the test case on this particular... Look, look at Clayton. Element. Clayton has nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> He's got four kids. All right. I, listen, I, I'll tell you what. I, I'm going to send you all some notes through the, through the uh, clerk. Um, you can uh, look at them or not. It doesn't make any difference to me. But rather than go through all of these, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, we'll Besides that, I'm still getting out of here without being fired. So I think. <laughs> so time to shut up, and I'm good with that. But we um, do appreciate all your efforts. I know quick, you're trying to do your job. You did say that it had it could be amended into the general plan. The county is working on redoing the general plan. Could something mm. like this be put into the general plan mm. that says, no, this is our limitations? Just something maybe to look into yeah. and answer so that question later on. The, the housing element of the general plan by statute is required to be approved by HCD. So. <sighs> <laughs> they have they've already uh, evaluated that as a possibility. I'm biting my tongue right now. Yeah. Closed off that avenue. Can I change that if I win something? <laughs> <laughs> I'll vote for it. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank I have you. nothing. Yeah. What are we done? Uh, yes. Yeah. Hit that hammer. Hit it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.